met a gypsy. Joe Hill, back on the podcast. <laughs> the king of the great man. <laughs> What's up, dog? <laughs> What's happening? Good to be over here on uh, on your West Coast West Coast studio. Yeah, Being well, sweet. the uh, yeah, there's no more no more Skype for us, bro. You don't have to worry about setting shit up. You just roll up to the studio, sit down, chill, crack a monster. That's what it's all about. <laughs> So, uh, big changes for you. Uh, you called me up last week and were like, dude, I'm driving out to the West Coast and uh, filling in for, for the, the big man himself, uh, Benny Bloss, on the, uh, on the KTM. What is that? The, uh, Tedder Racing Monster Energy KTM? Yeah, it's uh, Team Tedder Monster Energy KTM. Uh, Lucas Oil. Lucas yeah. Oil is one of their title sponsors. But yeah, well, I was hitting you up because I was going to... I was going to be your correspondent there for uh, the <laughs> yeah. Supercross companion because I wasn't going to be no- doing nothing, but I thought I was just going there to watch my brother race and have fun and try to catch some of the action with Buttery up in the nosebleeds. But then, uh, yeah, on Christmas, I got called um, that Bloss had gotten hurt and, you know, they were looking for somebody to race. So I showed up and, you know, we had about a week on the bike and went racing. I mean, it wasn't uh, wasn't my finest hour, but, uh, you know, I actually, I was, I, I didn't feel that far off, like, you know, I qualified like 24th and I, you know, only had a couple of days on the bike. So this week was good. I'm, it's just, it's just fun to be back racing. It's so gnarly. <laughs> Supercross is so gnarly. I just <laughs> love the, the guys that you're, you're like one of the dudes that, and like one of the rare, rare dudes that can like dip in and out. And it's not like you can, you're not a liability when you're out there, you know, like, I mean, fitness wise, you definitely like, you just haven't done the, the prep to you know be fit enough for to do these mains in the same way as the other guys but it's like in terms of just like the bike skill and the riding and the pace like you're one of the only dudes that can just get a call like this and show up and like actually make it happen (laughs) i i mean it's just you gotta just like let your ego go you know like when i was young you know i would probably laugh at myself for doing the things that i do now but like you know letting your ego go and being able to go out and not qualify but still try to do it or you know like go out and get 16th like it's just fun like racing there's nothing like it and then when I get to do it with like not the most amount of pressure you know like I'd never ridden a KTM before like other than maybe taking like a buddy's bike for you know a lap or two and bringing it back but so it was like a little bit to get used to and uh you know I I like I said I didn't feel all that terrible so I'm I'm kind of excited for the rest of these like I think if I wouldn't have went down I think I would have qualified I think had I not like given up in the heat race like because I thought I was in I thought I was way further back than I was like I'd actually made some passes and got up like uh like I had a clay sitting up behind, right behind Ray and then like three dudes fell if I would have just like I was like oh I better just save my energy for the LCQ <laughs> if I just would have stayed in it I wouldn't even had to go to the LCQ so yeah I don't know it's uh it's cool it's sick to be back yeah I was I was looking at it like you were probably gonna qualify like I I was uh I think the like the speed was there and stuff and uh and then yeah I think because you went down pretty early in the LCQ right like I even feel like you're probably gonna yeah, qualify was, through the LCQ yeah I mean I, I had the whole shot and then um so like we had the suspension that we were testing like we didn't really test before I went um uh, and you're like Benny Bloss you know he's a much bigger dude than me Yes. And so it wasn't like we had like the, it wasn't like I could just get on the bike, you know, like there's some dudes somewhat the same size as me. Like, okay, we'll just, we'll just, you know, tweak a few things on the suspension. It was like, we had to do a lot in a short period of time to get it, uh, you know, where, where it was comfortable. So I was, dude, I, like I was pretty like, pretty much like a fish out of water in practice. Like I was just, it was so rough and so gnarly and I was in the B practice and I was just like, okay, I'm just going to get through this smooth, get through this smooth. And I was just being a wimp all day. I wasn't even like skimming the whoops hardly. I was just, I was being a wimp. But even then, like I wasn't that far off, like the pace of, you know, like I still should have made it probably, you know, yeah, in, my, yeah. in my eyes anyways. Pro- probably not in those four dudes that made it through the LCQ's eyes, but through my eyes, I should have been in there. <laughs> dude the uh the lcq was actually pretty dope like when when breeze uh did you did have you watched the the tv coverage of it yet yeah yeah breeze yeah, like, gets it like the... three times <laughs> i love that about you dude 
Uh, when Breeze like crosses yeah. the finish line, he's just like throwing his goggles and like the whole fucking crowd's there just losing their shit. That was honestly the most excited I think the crowd was for the entire night. And it's just like, I don't think enough guys understand that like you can steal the fucking show so easy in Supercross. Like you can do it in a heat. You can do it in an LCQ. You can do it in a main. Like if you're on the track and you've got the camera on you, you can do some shit that will just completely steal the night. It's Stank Dog honestly had the biggest. He stole the show a hundred percent when he was like he was only like two spots out of transfer in on the one twenty five, and then he like blew his foot off on. And I don't know how he didn't just completely weed himself and get hurt, but he flies over that triple with his body, and you could tell he was in pain. But he just gets up and just claims it to the crowd. Doesn't even go back to his bike. He sat there for a whole lap just doing circles, claiming it to the crowd. And the place was going nuts. Like, the hardest they cheered the whole night. It was sweet. But, yeah, I mean, it's... that Anaheim's so sick. It's so sick that it's back. Like, there's no feeling like that. I was, like... To be honest, that was one of the first times ever that I've showed up to a race and kind of been, like, scared. Because I didn't, really? wasn't, like, super prepared, you know? And I was just on the line, and, like, Nichols gets hurt. Like, mm. boom, instantly, big crash, Nichols. That's one, you know? And, like, we're all just sitting down in the tunnel, hanging out. And, like, all we can do is watch the TV. We can't really see the rest of what's going on. And then, you know, people are crashing, trying to miss Nichols while he's down. I mean, it's just yard sale after yard sale. They, they didn't even show as much of, of what was going on on TV as what was, you know, there was just it was yard sales everywhere. Then the next start... Jalik Swole gets cross jumps, slams. I'm sitting on the line and uh, Carson Brown crashes, busts out both his front teeth and he comes walking like right by us with his mouth open, just dripping blood. I'm all, it like hadn't set in that I was actually there to race. You know what I mean? I didn't even have time to think about that side of things until I was on the line. I was all, damn, <laughs> do I want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I kind of rode like a little bit of a wimp in the heat race. I had to shake that off. And then in the LCQ, I was, you know, I went into it with the, with the mindset, I'm going to send it. And I almost got the whole shot. And then, uh, yeah, just, you know, send it a little too hard, I guess. Actually, it just, just hit a weird soft spot and just cross rutted So I, I think now that we've got like my bike a little bit more balanced with the suspension, I don't think that type of thing will happen next weekend. Dude, you, you are right. Like it was chaotic the whole night like we were i mean we were obviously like doing the supercross companion and there were so many times where we were just like whoa like what the fuck is going on and the track seemed gnarly for a1 like normally but i mean it didn't look like it was that crazy of a track i mean like even i don't know obviously like not being there the whoops um it, they didn't look like crazy whoop sections but i don't know there was just like something about the layout that just seemed to like really beat the track up yeah the, the whoops were just super trenched out so like you couldn't you couldn't like hardly roll through them you know what i mean yeah. like they were just like they were just like v's you know they're like super trenched and then they were that was like the only section on the track that was really hard pack like every everything else was really spongy so like they laid down like the the base the base layer of dirt or road base whatever they call it right yeah and then california just got hit with like torrential rains so it basically turned the stadium into soup is what like i was told because you know they lay down the plywood then they lay down the, the layer of the base layer of dirt and, and gravel and everything and then they started bringing they were bringing in dirt basically into a swamp mm. so it made just the transitions of everything like super sketchy like the tops of the jumps would be pretty hard pack but like the base from where you'd go off the floor to the jump faces like that that little you mm. know the, like the g outs were just nasty they'd try mm. to go clean them up five minutes later like you'd be dragging your foot pegs right at the base so it, that's i think why the track was gnarly like it wasn't like oh the jumps were Mm. bigger nastier it was just the transitions of everything because they brought it in with like a real soupy base so mm. i mean it'll be interesting to see what they do you know like I, i'm sure it's probably going to be like i bet the next anaheim if we don't get any more rain is going to be like hard pack because like all mm. that stuff's going to sit there and bake and they're going to have monster trucks doing burnouts on it just packing it down like <laughs> it'll probably be a lot different for the next one and even oakland's like dry right now so it hasn't rained yeah and since i think it um, here so the the other thing with Anaheim too, like even in the years where it kind of does get hard pack, there's something about the just 
that time of year in California when it when it goes from that dusk to night, you just always end up with so much more moisture, like I guess in the in the air as well. So I mean, even years where it's like, yeah, pretty dry and hard pack, you get to the night show and it's just it's always like they've just watered the thing. Like a you know what I mean? Like they've kind of hosed it down a bit. You you like that ocean mist that comes in because you're only yeah. like probably like 10 nautical miles from the beach you know as the crow flies so it's, yeah, that, that, <laughs> yeah so it's uh yeah, it always comes in and then when it's hard packed and that comes starts like the moisture starts coming in and it starts to get a little bit slimy like you'll hit something 30 times perfect and then that one time like it gets a little bit grooved out and you just and just slide up the face <laughs> anaheim's always tricky it's always unforgiving it's, for whatever reason yeah and I guess like you said, you know, you've got all that build up, all that hype. I feel like this year too, there's so many factors going into Anaheim that's not a normal season, even the fact that we haven't been there for a couple of years. So you've got like that whole vibe coming in and I think, you know, like I was just talking to Jacob before you come on here and uh he was saying that like just no restrictions. It was like pretty much just a free for all, which is like the first event in so long that that that's kind of happened and then you got everyone switching teams and you've got like there was a lot there's a lot going on people people were stoked people were there to party it was like everybody (laughs) was i mean the riders and everybody was hyped i mean i mean i was stoked to see people having fun again you know and and there Mm. wasn't there wasn't restrictions there wasn't somebody just you know walking around and be like you gotta put a mask on or you know like make like trying to trying to kill the buzz a little bit like they just let it go and uh, it was kind of surprising. So, I mean, I hope it keeps going that way. I mean, I think it's just kind of getting, things are starting to normalize again, it looks like. So that's, you know, gives me a little hope towards the future. I want to see people having fun, you know? Like, I'm old and I don't like, you know, party like I used to and have as much fun, but these, you know, these young kids need to have some fun. <laughs> don't want to skip yeah. a whole generation. <laughs> Dude, that's like, a, a, as a, as a sideline topic, it's fucking crazy to me like because i got two young dudes that work here now and it's like uh like roans particularly he finished school in uh not last year, so he did like all of last year was like his first year of full-time work and so he finished school a few months into the year before like 2020 i guess and uh it's like when i was 18 man i fucking bought a van and i just was like traveling all over filming and it was just like the vibe was so different and you think about all these kids that have left school in the last couple of years and like everyone travels in australia as soon as you leave school it's like you kind of piss off for a couple months and you you're out doing your thing but there's like a whole generation where it's just like they didn't even like alex's year 12 just completely different no parties no nothing like the the whole vibe of like that high school experience has been changed and then you think about like the kids that like their first year of school like so there's literally like you said a generation that's just like a bunch of normal shit has just skipped them yeah it's a it's a bummer so hopefully it's not like a real full generation of people hopefully it's just we had a couple of bad years there we can get back to having you know just just having fun letting people do what they want to do and enjoy life like i mean you could tell just in that crowd that they were they were hyped that people were hyped to be there i mean supercross got on tmz i mean that's pretty cool Maybe not for the best reason, but hey, people were having fun. <laughs> Dude, how, so, I mean, that, uh, how could you be mad at that chick for showing her tits? Oh, if my mom was there, she, she would have done the same thing, but she probably would have thrown <laughs> hands a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> nah, oh. yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's supposed, to be a fa- it's supposed to be a family environment, but, you know, they were... It's not like there was little kids behind them. You know what I mean? They were at the worst seats at the farthest point of the stadium that they were they were up there to be hood rats and do hood rat things. Like, you know, like that's why they were up there. They weren't there to watch the race. You know, like there's a it wasn't completely sold out. If you really wanted to, you know, even if you didn't have good tickets, you could still slide in somewhere good. That was yeah. like where everybody went to congregate to get drunk. And yell and scream and, and not be bothered. So that was know. the uh, that was the buttery hopefully those people section. hopefully the yeah yeah that's what, that's where he goes he draws he draws a, a crowd you know it's funny <laughs> I've been up in there with him a couple of times it's a good time but I like to watch the race so didn't uh, I uh, didn't, I'll go up there maybe for, up I'll there. go up there for the LCQs 
<laughs> yeah. Didn't you watch one with Sam and Buttery up in the in the nosebleeds one time? Oh yeah. Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix. <laughs> yes, that's what yeah, it was. I, that one. I had a broken arm and my brother wasn't having the best day. I could just tell like he kinda like basically told me to like beat it, you know, and I was trying to give him some advice. So I was just like, Well, I'm gonna get drunk in the stands with my buddies. <laughs> <laughs> Ended up meeting up with Sammy. <laughs> uh, Nick dude, Dez, I think, too. It was a good time. Phoenix is that's one of my favorite cities in America, like for partying. Scottsdale, Arizona is like that is the weirdest little city in the world. And fuck, it just delivers, just consistently delivers. I haven't spent that much time there. Like I've I've only gone for like mellow occasions, but I've I've like dropped friends up off and picked them up from there. But I haven't like really <laughs> too hard there. Seems it seems like a cool place though. We uh we used to go to the Phoenix Waste Management Open, which is like the the golf event oh, there, yeah. and it was like in Australia the biggest event where chicks get like dressed up and shit is the Melbourne Cup, which is like a horse racing event. And uh, it's they call it like the race that stops the nation. Literally, everyone in the country watches. It's like our Kentucky Derby, I guess. And um, and so yeah. that's like the the that's like the one one event where the chicks just get doled up to the nines. And then the waste management open was that mixed with like just a drunk as fuck frat dude party. And it was just the craziest <laughs> thing ever. And like by the end of the, because you got to think like how many chicks want to go there and try and catch the eye of like a super rich golf dude and uh and so like they're just out there on show and it's like as soon as that dream's over they just end up getting fucking wasted and it just spills into like literally as soon as they leave the golf it's just straight into scottsdale and the place was just heaving for four days it was out of control and you would not think that from a golf event yeah, it sounds like Happy Gilmore. I thought that I thought that that didn't happen. I like I've never been to a major golfing tournament or anything. I'm like I don't golf at all. Like when I try to swing, it's pitiful. It's not even <laughs> fun for me. It's fun for my friends that bring me to laugh at me golf, but that's that's my golfing experience. So, but uh, that's why I hear I hear it's fun. Yeah, that uh, that waste management is insane they've got this one par three so it's like a it's like a 140 yard hole and the whole thing is surrounded by a stadium like they legit build a stadium around this one golf hole and there's like a bunch of dudes like tiger woods one year got a hole in one there and they like almost fucking ripped the place apart like it's actually one of the it's one of the (laughs) sickest sporting events i've ever been to I just have to take your word for it. I don't even know what's going on. Uh, maybe maybe <laughs> one day when I'm a little bit older, when I get I get pulled into it, I'll go check it out. But I stick to uh, yeah, I stick to the action sports. Yeah, you need that. You need Which that I'm gasoline. I, I like. I'm staying strong on the golf. I'm keep, I'm staying strong. Everybody's golfing now. I'm not doing it. Everybody's golfing. I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a wave. It's funny how it comes in waves too. I've I've seen like two golfing waves in motocross. Yeah, like I remember back in like '95, like McGrath was trying to make golfing look cool in motocross. They do like they do like a little cutaway during the Supercross. It'd be like a one eight hundred collect commercial. They'd be out golfing and stuff. Yeah, it's coming back though. Everybody, like all my buddies, are doing it, and I'm like, I, it's just that I'm so bad at it that I'm super anti. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? that, like, I mean, everything hurts on me already. I don't need to go. I, I don't need to go mess up my hip and back swinging a golf club walking around. I'll go, I'll go dig a dig a jump. That, that's how I hurt my back today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that press release reads a bit different than uh, Hill out for the season <laughs> due to slipping a disc <laughs> on the 19th pole. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. That's so funny. So uh, uh, you've watched the race three times. Uh, you were so yeah. Actually, we'll backtrack a little bit. You were going to be our man on the ground at Anaheim. We we're gonna uh, we we're gonna we we're gonna get big hill to be walking around getting the dirt for us sending it back to the studio while we were soupy companioning um but then you get called up to race which i'm more pumped that you're racing than doing our correspondence to be honest um so we didn't we didn't get that to happen but uh i think i personally think that you're one of the uh the better 
contributors to moto media in terms of like your the opinion that like your take that you bring you just don't really get the chance to do it that much so after watching the race <laughs> now three times on on television what's your uh what's your thoughts on a1 in the in terms of the big boy the big boy class and the little boy class well i think that uh i mean roxon looked good roxon looked good all the whole time he's just he's solid and uh it was kind of i don't know Every, there's so many fast guys like Anderson it's crazy. Looked good. Mookie looked really good Muskin in press day I was like Muskin's gonna smoke I thought Muskin looked the best out of everybody in press day but really? then I had to remind like remind myself that they, we weren't running the whoops then mm. so like the whoops were big so then I think that kind of you know messed him up a little bit I don't know they're like so Sexton looks super good I mean I think everybody thought Sexton was gonna win that moto for a minute like he just kind of maybe got a little impatient. He probably maybe got a little frustrated, not knowing what to do. Like, do I stuff yeah. this dude? Do I like, you know, yeah. do I try to be the <laughs> flex up on him, be the top Honda guy? We're like, where am I at right now? I, I, I'm sure that was running through his head. I mean, I had a race at Anaheim where I was behind James and I was, you know, James is a little bit banged up and I was going faster. And then we had guys coming up behind me and I was like, you know, I was, what do I do? And I'm like, I'm not supposed to pass this guy, but I, I can, you know, it's uh it's probably, he probably had a lot going through his mind there for a minute. So, yeah, I know, it's I gonna think, be. Yeah, oh, sorry, it's gonna be interesting. I, 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 I think like you know, Webb, Webb just Webb didn't look flashy at all all, all day. You know, he, he looked good, not, not like he looked bad or nothing, but he didn't look like top of the world. And then what does he do? He just motors through and get you know comes through the pack, gets up to second. And I mean, on the track with some of the gnarliest whoops that I've seen in a long time. So. Yeah, I think uh, the we'll we'll break that down into sections because there's a lot there. So the yeah. with Kenny, it's like that's just his deal, right? At any weekend, any given time, he can come up and just literally smoke everybody. Um, I reckon I sort of said it in the Soupy Companion at the end of it, which I, I probably was like actually a little bit too critical, but. It's just like a dude that, like, we used to be pretty tight, you know? So, it's like I see it and I'm just... You know when you, you can, like, talk shit on someone as, like, you talk shit on your friend in a way, I guess? Um, but I don't know if it comes across like that when I'm actually saying some shit. But I was pretty, like... Both times, like, after the heat race, he gets on the podium and it was just so, like, flat. And it's like, all right, I get it that you're probably... Like, he was sick in December, not feeling the best. But, and he probably doesn't have that much energy on the podium. But I'm like, dude, you get 30 seconds. Like, all of these guys are going to watch the race back on TV. You get 30 seconds to just, like, say some shit that is going to, like, move you forward a little bit in the whole, like, in the big picture, you know what I mean? Like, and Webb's the man at that. Like, he can, Webb can make, like, one sentence on the podium really, really matter. And then Kenny gets on there and just made it feel like he thought it was a fluke that he won the heat race. And then he wins the main and it was the same, the same thing. And I'm just like, as a, as a, as a fan of him, I'm like, dude, take your fucking, take this moment that you've got, like, you just smoked everybody. And yes, you feel like shit, but like you could really turn that into something, you know, instead of making it sound like you actually can't believe you even did good. It's just, it's like, wouldn't you get on there and flex up a little bit and be like, damn, I just smoked everybody and I feel like shit. I can't wait to post the Instagram video of like me barely being able to breathe three weeks ago, you know? So I don't know that, that for me with Kenny, <laughs> I was just like, I was so impressed with the ride and then so unimpressed with like the way that he leveraged that on the podium, I guess. Yeah, I mean, everybody takes it a little bit differently. Maybe he just doesn't want the, you know, maybe he doesn't want the the target on his back, even though it's mm. going to, you know, come there no matter what. I mean, when you look that good and you win by double digits at, at A1 and make it look, you know, I mean, I guess he didn't really make it look easy because Sexton made it, you know, it, I guess, what, eight laps in. It looked like Sexton might be the guy. Uh, but yeah. then Sexton made some mistakes and Roxon was gone. And maybe just that meek, humble approach is what he thinks is going to work best for him you know he doesn't want to maybe he wants to even fool himself into thinking that it's a fluke mm. you know, oh, we should just keep doing this let's make this fun I don't know and then like 
you know, on the other end, you got Cooper Webb is probably going up to the line with like Rick Ross blaring his headphones. Like, I think I'm Big Meech, Larry Hoover. You know, like he's probably up there just going like, you know what I mean? Like he's, they're just wired different. And I, you know, I think it maybe just attends to, to their riding styles. You know, I feel like Ken's probably one of those guys that he's so fluid and so good that like he probably just like really f- comes into his own when he's relaxed and having fun and not no pressure you know and then Webb's just that guy I feel like that just thrives on the tears yeah. of others <laughs> you know he's just a, <laughs> he's just got that that beast mentality um and you know like I said he, he never you know not discounting the guy at all but he never looks like that guy that's super flashy in practice even in the heat race like you know occasionally you'll see him do something like well that was really good but he he just seems to come come along for the main event come along for when it counts like you know even like i think what was he like 12th or 13th fastest mm. in practice like you know yeah. and that that happens a lot with him until the series yeah i i think you know almost every opener he's kind of you know mick jumbled in the back and then what does he do he, he shows up when it counts so yeah i think it's uh, gonna be interesting i mean and there's so many guys we didn't even mention that are going so fast and oh, they, they all think they can win. Well, I think there's legitimately, I'd say, 10 to 12 dudes that I can see winning a race this year. And it's like, that's pretty 10 to 12. Gnarly. You think 10 to 12 are going to win? Can win. You think 10 to 12 guys? Uh, can, How many you can think will win. win? What's that? I think How probably think f- will win? five or six. That's okay. So you read, you read up on the statistics because that's, that's, I think six is the most it's ever won in a series. Really? I read that statistic and I was like, really? Like, but yeah, I guess six is the most. I forget what year it was. Like maybe like 99 or something. Yeah. Like right. I don't know. Yeah. I would, six, I would say yeah. like, all right. So who do you think like, well, this is mine. I think obviously Ken Coop, uh, I think Chase Sexton can win. Eli Tomac can win. I think Dylan Ferrandis can win. Like, so there's a lot of guys I think can like, I. Uh, that's five dudes instantly. Malcolm, can he win a main? You know, there's all those fringe guys where it's like, if a few things go right, they can definitely win. I think that there's five or six guys where they don't really need things to go right. Like they can just outright win a race. Um, so yeah, I think that yeah. there's, yeah, there's probably like 10 to 12 guys where uh, that legitimately could win this year. But I think there's probably six or seven of those guys where like a few things have to go right for them to win. But I can see them being in the position where things could go right, if that makes sense. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, you know, we can obviously Cooper, obviously Eli, obviously Sexton is definitely got the speed to do it. Uh, You know, Mookie has the speed to do it. I think, Anderson, you know, I think he's he's ready to go again. He like yeah, he looks time. fired up. Barsha you can know, win. Cincerello he's has won last year. Barsha can win for sure. Um, yeah. you know, then then you know, AP had a rough day. AP uh Aaron Plester crashed yeah. crashed I think in the whoops. It was first practice. And he too. had a rough day. Yeah, you could tell he was just like he, he didn't look like he was I think he smashed his nuts pretty hard yeah, too. Like, yeah, that's was, what happened. He like, I think he got the wind taken nuts, out of yeah. his sail. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I think I have a feeling him and that new bike are going to gel pretty good. Uh, he looked pretty good on it. I mean, I, there's just so many guys. And well, I'm, sure I'm, I'm gonna, making somebody mad that I'm not talking about. I'm going to come out and say that this year, then knowing that I didn't know that statistic, but I, I'm going to come out and say that this year will be the most 450 winners we've ever had in a season. Uh, it's it's a possibility for sure. I definitely think it's a possibility. We'll see though. Who knows? You know, they, they, it always seems like this, and then then maybe, yeah, Ken and Cooper and Eli just take off and just somehow separate themselves from everybody. You know, it's just weird how it works. So as far how as it's a, a, crazy how those th- those guys seem to rise the, to the top every time. Well, so this I actually did see a stat for that, and it was in the last like I think it was like four seasons or five seasons or whatever it is. Eli, Ken, and Coop have won eighty five percent of the main events. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> That's I mean, so gnarly, dude. Yeah. Well, who else even won? Uh, like Brayton won one. Yeah. Barsha won 
three. Bosch has won a couple, yeah. Uh, uh, Ma- uh, Mav. And uh, has has he won in the last three years? Did Mav won last year? Yeah, he did. Yeah, did Mav win? A, Mav won a. Remember, because it was right. Do I only know this because it was right as me and Rhino did the podcast, and he was talking about Marvin won't win until he takes his neck brace off, and the motherfucker okay, took yeah, his neck right, brace yeah. off the next weekend. Was it like <laughs> it was just, or something like that, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Marv can win again this year. He looks good. Yeah, um, yeah it's the, really wild. we'll see what happens. I knew that Kenny. Uh, you know that that big long right hander. It was almost like a triple apex, where it was kind of like flat. You had like a little single deal going into it, and then you kind of yeah. kept going flat. There was uh, there was like this pretty nice little rut there the whole way around that turn in first practice. And Kenny, dude, feet on the pegs the entire way around that turn. And then I think there was like Malcolm was behind him, and it was just the it was the most like obvious contrast of uh riding styles that i've ever seen and malcolm had the f- fastest lap time in that quali and kenny just like literally pulled away from him in this section where mookie was just like full charge mode and kenny just cruising on the pegs and i was like uh yeah he's fucking on i seen a picture of that and i was like i was pretty surprised he was able to do that because that thing it like you said it had like so many apexes to it it was like you had to follow the same it was kind of like a slippery flat turn then you had to find the rut and then it had like a roller in the rut and then the rut came back out so that's pretty sweet that he was able to do that he's got some crazy skill <laughs> like a guy uh he's you know especially for a guy that you know came over from europe that you know doesn't have a supercross background you know like he wasn't the most skillful guy in supercross when he came over i mean he was he was making the highlight reels every every week in his first year. I mean, he was young and he was going for it, but like his his skill is like really, really turned around. Like you know, he's honed that for like that specialized Supercross skill is so good, which is wild to come from you know a GP background and do that. Yeah, and and I think you got to give Marv that same credit too, eh? Because I mean, obviously Marv doesn't have like the same the same wins, but it's a similar deal you know like he come over i know kenny had a supercross track in his in his backyard for a long time like as a kid and he would kind of like ride it on 80s which it doesn't really count for i guess that much when you consider how different the tracks and stuff are over here um but yeah marv as well eh? like to come over and just make such a like you because you essentially can't make like a really long career in america when you're from Europe, unless you've got the Supercross component like super dialed in. Yeah, I mean, the 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 French have this like they have a pretty good sized Supercross championship though. Like yeah, true, huh? I think they have like six or seven rounds usually, maybe even eight. That like they have a few rounds in the summer, like in outdoor venues, and then they like this one called like I actually got a chance to go to. It's called La Tremblade. And uh, it's like kind of by the coast in France, and it is sick. It's like a, it's a like a stadium specifically made for Supercross. It's like a big giant circle with like it's all grass, you know. And everybody comes in and sits, and they bring in lights and have a. It's like it's like Bercy Supercross, like in a field, you That's know, that so has a sick. big natural amphitheater. Um, so like Supercross is kind of in the French culture, you know. Like they, yeah, you know, it is in Germany too, but the German. Supercross is a little bit more. It's I think, like arena, arena cross, crossy. Yeah. yeah, it's like sketchy arena cross. It's like <laughs> big jumps, but still in the same size building. Like, <laughs> it, everything's super peaked. I've always been scared to go over there. Maybe I'll make it over one day, but it looks pretty hairy. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. the thing uh, I was going to say too, when you, you talked about Cooper's ride, um, I think if you're Coop, that's probably the best case scenario for Anaheim because he I think he's just going to straight up win races on speed this year like I think that you'll see there'll be races where he's just feeling the track the bike's good he's good he'll get a really good start and then you know he might be up front with let's say it's like a Sexton or a Ferrandis and he just kind of outworks him and then the last three laps you see him just pull away and win the main event just straight up and so it's like they're going to happen but then for A1 to be, like, he was pretty far back. 
and just to slam his way through the pack on a like a pretty gnarly track i think that's probably like a pretty that's a pretty massive ride for him and i think that instantly t- ticks that box for him knowing that every time he goes to a track and he's like you said 12 fastest in practice that he's going to be able to uh he's like oh cool i can still get on the podium and like can you imagine that kind of mental uh strength that would come from qualifying 12th and finishing second and just to know that like you pretty much then equate every shit qualifying with a second on the night yeah maybe i don't i don't know i mean maybe he just uh maybe he knows the whole time that maybe he's just not putting the emphasis on qualifying Mm. as everybody else is you know like like laying it on the line and taking risks to get that you know get that one single lap you know maybe he's just trying to do more consistent laps and ride around with people and not stress it you know Mm. that, that could be something to why he's you know to why he's able to find that race craft on people in the races because if you watch you know guys like you know, Roxon and yeah, pretty much any of the top guys if they come up on somebody and they get into a battle and it slightly affects their lap they just pull off mm. you know and like okay I'll we'll try this again <laughs> you know restart it uh, I'm I'm guilty of doing it myself and you know I'm always yelling at my little brother like don't do that race with the guys like figure it out and it's way easier said than done when your heart rate you know when you go from zero to a hundred real mm. quick on like the from you know rolling the track to then like when I cross this line I got to give it everything I have it's it's pretty tricky and I think maybe that maybe Cooper just doesn't always put the emphasis on being the fastest guy maybe mm-hmm. he's out there carving guys up and figuring out what works and maybe stringing together two or three laps that are just you know 95 percent instead of just that one lap that's just all or nothing that you know you you f- you always ride a little bit tighter too I feel like when you when you try to just hammer down for mm-hmm. once you know one little bit so maybe that you know that could be the difference and some people are just really good at doing that and other people aren't some people like to just you know ride into their own like i don't know like you go to those european supercrosses and some of those guys can just hammer oh, one lap dude. out so fast they can and eh? then you know yeah it's and then you know some guys just aren't built like that some people are just that doesn't even cross their mind trying to go all out for one lap like they start to get faster as it goes so that could be what you know what's going on with Cooper. Uh, has, has the whole qualifying, like, have you seen? Because you've had a, like a long career at this point. Like you've been in the game a really long time, and still, like I said, you're still at a fucking super high level. Have you seen any changes in how people approach qualifying and stuff? Because it's a pretty. Uh, like if you think about qualifying in like Formula One or MotoGP, it's like a pretty big deal. Like watching qualifying is about as cool as watching the race itself. Whereas in our sport, it's kind of almost like an underrated kind of thing and people aren't really watching it in the same way. But have you seen like changes in the way dudes try and qualify or like the importance people place? Or is there like any, has it, has like the art of qualifying evolved since you started your career, do you think? Yeah, I don't think anybody really put that much emphasis on it in the beginning. Uh, like when I came in in like 2007, 2008, it was almost just like a statistic that you you know you'd get back and you'd get a printout sheet from the AMA that would say who qualified what. Like we back back uh, in 08, I don't even know if they had the like the tower mm. that said first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So like you just come back like I you know I remember being like when I was 18 in the 450 class I think I threw down a couple of good laps like I would usually try to do a good lap try and like using this rhythm section and then I try to do a good lap using this rhythm section Uh. and almost like I wasn't trying to race against anybody else I was just trying to see like so I could go back and know okay on lap five I hit this combination was this you know just so then I would know what was the line to take for the race that was kind of how we thought about qualifying not like oh you know gate pick didn't seem all that important I guess back then Maybe it, maybe it was, or maybe maybe I was just dumb and naive and didn't <laughs> didn't think about it as a kid. But you know, it was just it was one of those things. Like I I you know I would come back to the truck and they're like you fastest and I'm like oh sweet cool like but you, <laughs> yeah. there was no trophy there was no like nobody you know, only people that got those printout sheets even knew or yeah. you know maybe back in the day if there was some hardcore vital dudes you know they would go on there and find it where now it's getting more and more uh, you know it's getting more and more. 
I guess, pushed upon. And I think it's awesome that we have, you know, the Supercross live thing. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I don't know if you guys have, do you have the Peacock? Are you able just to like down no, buy I'm on the, the I'm on the Supi live. Okay, yeah. Well, they over here we have this this Peacock app, and we're able just to, you know, get we just download or pay for this app, and then we get everything for Supercross. Like I can watch every practice, every, you know, every Supercross. I can go back and replay it if I'm on the you know spin bike. I can just set it on my phone and watch it. And I think that that's huge for for the qualifying. I mean, even though it's not like you know, national TV or the I mean, it shows that the the qualifying is not on national TV, but just the fact that we can go in and watch that and study that and go back and look at it, I think is awesome. Cause for a long time, like we just kind of had like a grainy, like live webcast of yeah. like one camera, like overlooking the track. And then you'd hear like, you know, Irv Braun, the old announcer, like talking about practice. Like that was pretty much what, yeah, that's pretty much what you got was, was that. So now it's cool. I mean, they, the Supercross live guys, I think do a good job. And, and you know, now that's, that's their show. They're, they're, they're trying to pump up practice yeah. now you know like yeah. they're trying to pump up the qualifying and i mean maybe maybe next year somebody will throw like some incentive out there you know like what if there was what if there was like a five thousand dollar bonus to qualify first like that would be enough for you know maybe you know get a little get a little extra aggression out there yeah well, i good, think uh good signage for somebody yeah well i think that i mean i almost wouldn't mind there being points like you know two points for for the fastest quality or something like that or or a point like i mean i think that that's well i definitely noticed this year like especially in my crew like that i talked to and then the people that messaged me through the podcast and that it's one of the it's one of the fucking coolest days to have instagram really is uh soupy days like moto memes busted out like 15 memes that were all fire and uh i got people dming me all day about shit like it, it was actually like a, a fucking vibe this this uh at, at a1 and so many people like so many more people than than i've ever seen were actually like watching practice so in oz how it works out is basically 7 a.m is the first a practice for the lights class and then you go into the 450 so it's pretty much like i'm like up and then bang watch both a practices and then like have some breakfast dick around and then watch the next one so it's like it's actually works out kind of perfect supercross takes up your entire day in australia until about 5 p.m don't lie you guys are all still up it's it's sunday morning you guys are still up <laughs> wait that program's <laughs> that program's being done and done i honestly can't even remember the last time i was drunk dude <laughs> same i like one uh actually i think i got a little drunk in france after after paris i had my I had my fiance molly and my good buddy from uh he was my mechanic back when i was like 18 uh he came with me to help mechanic for me it, it Paris Supercross and so after the race we went out and had a few drinks but other than that there's uh I live out in the sticks now man I don't really party no more there's just nothing to like I just hang out with uh with my girl and her family and ride dirt bikes I went to Hooters and watched football the other day and there's some dude in there that he recognized me from racing he bought me bought me a, a couple of shots that's, that's about it that's his that's as as wild as I've been getting. Uh, I, that was on my uh, on my list of notes. We might as well just go there right now. Congratulations on getting engaged, mate. You uh, uh -huh. you and Molly are fucking really cool people, both of you guys. I'm massive fans of of the both of you guys. So it made me really happy to see that. Oh, thanks, man. She's uh, she's awesome. She's just like made made life just have so much more meaning. I feel like I think she's just a sweet person. Got the sweetest family. Great head on her shoulders. I'm. I'm lucky that I, I tricked her into liking me, so it's cool. It's uh, it's cool. Like, uh, you're one of the guys that has experienced like the uh, the full gamut, or like the full spectrum of uh, being the fucking young superstar guy that I'm sure was just fucking crushing a lot of pussy and had like that whole deal going on for a long time, <laughs> and then to. Uh, to then fully go into just like finding an amazing chick and then just being all in and the, and like you said 
actually finding the legitimate meaning and legitimate happiness in that because there's there's definitely dudes that aren't as pumped on their chick as, as what you are you know like this has kind of gone through the motion so it's like you've kind of you've really experienced like the full kind of gamut of uh of what it's like to be a fucking uh a dude in the i guess like the relationship sphere uh in like our modern generation you know yeah, well, I just, I mean, I started out like racing young and then, you know, just kind of running around. I had a lot of, you know, like I had a, f- a few long-term girlfriends and then just things didn't work out. And then I kind of, after I ran, you know, just after a while, I just thought, oh, I don't want a girlfriend, like some, anything serious for a while. So then you start having a little bit of fun and everything. And then just, I guess as I got older, just the, just partying and doing the same thing and doing the same circles actually really when I was start, I was going working for monster it was kind of like you know that, that was kind of my job was to to take people out and show them a good time and, and you know show athletes a good time or who, whoever you know if somebody was important in town you know set set this up you know so you're kind of incentivized to to go have a good time and have a few drinks and and after after a while like you know when I'd race and I'd do good, I'd go out and celebrate something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, if I accomplished something, I'd go out and celebrate with my friends and my boys and just, you know, have a good time and, you know, get, give ourselves a big pat on the back. Yeah. But when you're doing that, celebrating, you know, when you work for Monster, somebody at Monster is, you know, accomplishing something great every weekend. Uh, yeah. So you're always celebrating something and then it's not, it's not your deal. So, you know, you kind of, I just, I had to take a step back and just, I, you know, I, I went probably, I don't know, I, did, I didn't drink at all for like a while just, just to do it, just to put, you know, I took a step away from that world when I, when I got back into riding and stuff and moved out to North Carolina and I just wanted to relax. And honestly, I've been more fulfilled now doing, you know, next to no going out yeah. than I did, you know, every, when everything was just blending into one. So it's, I mean, you know, finding a good chick and finding somebody that you just really love and care about like is is amazing. You know, like I wake up and I'm with my best friend every day, so it's it's great. You know, even if even if I'm you know I moved out to North Carolina, I don't have as many of my close friends that I had growing up. But you know, nowadays we get to stay in contact through you know yeah. whether it's I'm playing Xbox with Hanson and Polatelli or if I'm you know Facetime and scranny and he's showing me something crazy and then i still plan trips to come out to california and stuff so it's uh it's cool the riding out north in north carolina is really fun too so it's 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 got a it's got its perks out there uh i think that yeah i mean i think that it gets kind of like a bad rap these days like it's sort of sort of almost like not cool to have a chick and i, I mean i know like i felt like that when i lived in america that it was like uh it was just it was just not the move like you were wasting you were wasting your time if you fucking had a girlfriend and that, i don't know they just seemed like there was such like a a different kind of vibe around that but i mean yeah i think uh, maybe it's just part of getting older you know or like you you do find like the right chick i think your boys are always going to give you a hard time like what are you doing you know like they want you with them you know like they they want like if they don't got something solid they don't want you having something solid you know, like you got to be out with them, like running game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Working some schemes. <laughs> <laughs> what? So what? Uh, I guess like what was the? Because uh, I mean, it's funny. Like, I actually get asked quite a lot about. Like, there's some dudes that um, they'll message through the podcast, and I'm like, oh man fucking i've like loved the podcast it's like helped my life with this and it's like good motivation hearing from all these people and blah 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 but that's and i get a lot of people asking about like relationship stuff and i don't i've never really been one to like want to kind of uh i guess like talk about that side of it um but fuck i was thinking the other day like i got a message from a guy and he, he asked about it and i was like man maybe it is worth like talking about it because i yeah i feel like it gets kind of a bad rap and then I feel like, uh, yeah, it's maybe just a part of the, the part of the puzzle that dudes kind of struggle with is like, you know, to find that good chick and maybe like appreciate that good chick when you got her. Spoken like a true simp. 
<laughs> I'm just, <laughs> Gay. I mean, yeah, obvious, obviously, like if you find somebody that you love and makes you happy, I mean, you got to try to do your best to reciprocate that and be true to that. Like that's, I mean, I sound like Montel Williams over here, but uh, no, I'm not. I just, I'm lucky that I found somebody that, you know, I just, I truly love every day I wake up and I see her and I'm excited to be around her, you know, even when, you know you know we're sick we're both looking rough whatever it's still like my favorite person to be around like you know her uh just personality that you know the, the way that we connect is i feel like it's gonna go a long way past you know i already don't look that good she still looks good but you know i feel like our you know our relationship's gonna go way past those you know physical uh attractions i think so that yeah. you know just like I said, she's got the, the nicest family, just great people. She's got a great head on her shoulder. You know, she actually did, uh, she had a full scholarship at a Christian college, uh, for volleyball back in the day. Um, she was like, I think she was NCAA player in the year of the year coming out of high school. What? And then, you know, she worked for the mayor, mayor of Charleston. Like, I don't know how I landed her. I got, I got lucky. And then, you know, she's she's worked hard to where she can do like a, you know, work remote job. So then she just enjoys coming and, you know, playing or playing around with, with my little hobbies. You know, she didn't know anything about this motocross stuff. And she just, you know, when I'm busy, she's running around like meeting people, just enjoying it as much as any other fan. She's funny. She's taking pictures of stuff. Like she's, she just has a good time running around and enjoying it, making friends. It's cool. That's so sick. And so where are you at on the kids thing? I I hope uh, I hope to have kids soon. We're getting married, so I you know want to. I don't want her to be you know I don't want her to be showing or anything on on our wedding day. So I've been kind of trying just to wait, but you know as I, pull I out games still closing in. I know like you know this this the ceiling's closing in. You know we're uh, we're getting we're getting older. You know, and I know like I'm sure with modern medicine you can you know old older people can you know still have kids and everything but I think it gets harder and harder past 35 so you know I think we're we're starting to we're starting to think about that starting to think about plant planting my seed and starting a family and you know I'm excited about it I see my I see all my other friends doing it too like you know Politelli and Hanson's got a kid my little brother's got a daughter that's the cutest thing ever and he's got another little boy on the way and you know it's just as as a kid I was you know I'm glad that I didn't have you know have any children until now because I was selfish you know I was worried about myself I was worried about what I wanted um you know and and now that I'm I'm getting older and I see like the yeah I want to have a I want to have a family I think that it'll just give me a kind of like a second lease on life like I've done a lot of cool stuff already now I can now I can hold somebody else's hand through it and try to go show them a good time yeah, that that's like the I go back and forth on the kids thing, like just for the yeah, like it's hard to be selfish when you uh, when you got a kid, but that's definitely one of the things that I think about with having kids is like fuck, I learned so much through mistakes and through different experiences, and and I, I always think uh, I'm like man, I I feel like having a kid is like a project that you get it's like you get delivered this little project and it's like all right here's this fucking human that you can make into an absolute animal like you know if i have like a a a young a young son it's like this kid would be a fucking killer like with everything that you know from your life like you get a chance to just pass everything down and it's like you have a little girl it's like you could have the most like badass chick and and i think too in i mean it's one of the i guess one of the ways i think about it is like I think that for 90% of just like, maybe not 90%, but just the majority of people just really aren't having a fucking legitimate crack at life. Like there's so many people just mailing their life in. And I think about that, like if you have a kid and you give a kid some like really legitimate skills, like think about the head start you can give a kid in life by being like a good parent, you know? Yeah. I mean, I see some of my buddies that, you know, they're, you know, just working normal jobs and, yeah, you know, they're not they're not really able to get ahead too crazy, but they're just putting everything that they can into their into their kids' lives and taking them to the dirt bike track or you know taking them to the skate parks and just trying to teach them stuff and just spending that time with them. I think that yeah, I mean that that's what I mean by just being selfish. Like you know your time is 
your time mm-hmm. is probably the most valuable thing once you start having kids. Like I remember when I was like 14, 15, 16, growing up in Oregon, I remember just the, the sheer boredom that I would have back then. You know, we didn't have <laughs> cell phones. Like, I mean, maybe you get on my, like, I just had, there was days of sheer boredom. And now, like, the days just blow by. Like, it just, everything just keeps going into one. It seems like the pace just keeps picking up. So, you know, we're running out of time. We've got to, you know, can't be selfish with it. So hopefully, you know, I would love to have children. Hopefully we're able to. Hopefully God blesses us with, you know, with the ability to do that. So that that would be exciting. But it's it's so cool to see these, you know, all these other people just, you know, just watching my friends turn into actual, you know, actual men, you know, yeah. that are, you know, taking, standing up, working hard, taking care of their families, growing, you know, growing their kids into awesome people and, you know, sharing the, the memories that we had, you know, with our parents and stuff, riding dirt bikes and bicycles that show, sharing that with kids. Like that's, that's so cool. I mean, a lot of my buddies, like, you know, they're like fighting the dirt bike thing, but then yeah. they get them on a strider and then they get them on a, you know, uh, those little electric ones. Uh, then, you know, then they get them a PETA, you know, it just, it just keeps growing and it just, yeah, it's dangerous, but man, it's it's worth those those times with your family are worth it. I mean, that's those are the best memories of my life. Man, I I fully had uh, I fully had the thinking that for a long time, like probably like eight years after like after Andrew McFarlane died, I was like, I'm done with the moto thing. Like I'm fucking out of this shit. And I was like, I won't let my kids ride and all that. And then then when I moved back home, I started like just riding again. It, the podcast got me back into it, but. Uh, then I started thinking like, dude, this is the best thing. Like me and my, me and my dad are still homies and I'm fucking 33. And it's like me and my brother still ride every weekend. Like, and then my mom comes to races and she's still like cooking everyone food and shit. Like bringing a massive free, like we rode, uh, the day, uh, a couple of days after Christmas. And then mom like rocks up to the track and she's got like this huge cooler full of food that she just cooked for everyone. So it's like, yeah, I, I feel like that is priceless about what we do and like the way we grew up for sure yeah i mean it's just it's motocross you know that getting back to like you know that girl being mad at the girl you know pulling up her shirt at anaheim you know motocross is is, it's a family sport that's where we all came you know we that's where we all came from you know you don't get into motocross usually by you know without having a family member yeah. or a good friend that brings you into it like no not too many people i don't think just show up at the dirt bike track or dirt bike shop and just be like yeah i want that one give me that one let's go i'm gonna go race like most <laughs> yeah. people like get brought into it either by a family or a friend so it's a close-knit deal and i mean that's the yeah the times that i've had you know even just the adventures of getting to the tracks and getting to those races that's like that's some of the best memories I have. Yeah, I mean, like, no, you know, dude. Spend, I remember. I remember freezing my butt off in a box van with my whole family at Loretta Lynn's. You know, back when I was a little kid. You know, just my grandpa would be there. I mean, we. It's, it's just awesome. It's. It's. We're so lucky that we got to do that stuff. I, I'm yeah. so glad that we didn't do the team sport route. You know, I'm like even as gnarly as motocross is and how it worked my body is. It's like I still wouldn't. I wouldn't change it. Not for a thing. Do you do you have like a first memory like when of being a kid? Like if you like think back or do you have that as like a on tap response of like this is the first thing I remember as a kid? Dude, honestly the first thing I remember is riding a dirt bike. Yeah, and on the exact same. What's crazy is what's crazy is is when I did real moto last what was it, two thousand or two thousand twenty we did real moto. And uh you know, they're like trying to get us to find our old archives of stuff I was doing like you know hey are you racing at world baby you you know you young on a bike we happened to find the very first day I rode a bike so and it was like a full-on you know big camcorder video recording like my mom and my grandpa are video and like my dad starting me up and it's crazy how like it, it was it just it was exactly how I remember it like it, it was <laughs> really? it's so wild because that was the most like vivid memory that I had as a kid was just riding around in this field in downtown Portland or not downtown Portland but southeast Portland right off Powell Boulevard right by my grandpa's tool shop there's just this field right off one of the main roads and I remember I remember vividly I you know kicked these like two stick 
piles of dirt pile like you know mole holes into like a little jump i thought i was going to jump them first day and you know sure enough like i find this old video and it was exactly how i remember it so it's kind of it's pretty cool you know and then they this this guy's uh mac dog over there mac dog productions they like remat you know up resed everything they put it on a hard drive for me so now like you know that's not even going to get lost it probably would have you know in a couple of years burnt out you know the, the film doesn't last that long so pretty sweet pretty cool i found that stuff it's crazy though like i was curious as to if it was the same for you because i can't really remember a lot else from my childhood like if i had to go back to like earliest earliest memories it, there's probably five or six times where i was like super young and i just remember bikes but i can't really remember anything that was like around that time that wasn't to do with bikes yeah, I remember two two other things, like riding a bicycle. I remember like riding a bicycle with my dad down the street in Portland. And then I remember one time I fell, my grandpa had this little like kind of janky elevator to move tools from downstairs to upstairs, like to the storage. And at that time when we were kids, we lived above my, my grandpa's tool store. There was like an apartment up there. And I always, they'd always keep the elevator at the top for me because you just open the door and it was just a full story drop. And the elevator wasn't up, and I tried to climb down the stairs and ate it, and, or down, down like the ladder, and I fell off, which I must have landed in a bunch of cardboard boxes or something because I didn't get beat up. But I remember one that that was like the only other memory I have is like thinking I was gonna die for like a split second when I was like <laughs> super little, falling off, of, falling down an elevator. But extreme, extreme memories only. <laughs> I wonder if that's what it is. <laughs> like, I wonder if. Uh, like you've only got a certain capacity for memories as you as you get older and it's like there was something so gnarly about like dirt bikes and shit that uh like but it, maybe it is just something about like the extreme stuff like i have a couple memories of uh my buddy used to have like a billy cart that he built and uh the thing was just janky as fuck and we we he had this hill that we used to go to um there was like a pretty small hill and then it like run off into this kind of park deal and uh and we used to go there all the time we'd be like fucking we were just doing custom fab jobs as as like seven year olds on this uh on this wooden cart and then i, I have like one memory of one day i would say to the boys i was like nah we're going to this other hill so we like snuck out of this house as like family barbecue we like snuck out of this house and went to a fucking crazy hill and uh i remember getting halfway down this thing and just being like there's no way I like this is not safe to get to the bottom of this thing so then I like halfway I tried to like hit the hit the uh the emergency exit of just going left like into you know the grass of one of the houses and just fucking yards out this thing so hard on the road just rip skin, skin off everywhere but it's like yeah they're my only <laughs> memories it's like these gnarly fucking times of being a kid yeah yeah just the gotta gotta make room for the 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 smaller insignificant memories got to make room for the big ones like, <laughs> yeah. i think it's real like you could probably like i read somewhere you could only remember like 160 names or something somebody's yeah. trying to say like, I don't yeah know it's like, true, uh, like you know it's just weird right well i think that's i think it's called the, the dunbar number and it's like 100 it's yeah it's like 150 or 160 that like our brain is not uh is not like able to to remember more than that number of people but then every once in a while you'll just be like something completely <laughs> yeah. non-important just like you pop like some random fact was pop oh yeah that you'd be trying to tell somebody you know a story say somebody's name and you'll sit there for you, it's on the tip of your tongue and then just two days later you're driving down the road like oh yeah that guy well it's i just uh works. dude i just maybe lost it's just my... we've crashed too many times too yeah maybe i uh i just lost my passport recently and uh it just turned into the biggest fucking nightmare like of all time because i it was just like a chain of events like i someone broke in my car so then i lost my wallet and then that had my license and then i just couldn't be fucked going to the dmv so then i did a flight and i was like i'll just use my passport i come home from the airport couldn't find my passport when i've gone to fly and then uh like i could not remember i knew you know when you i like I knew for a fact, I was like, I 100% got this off the plane and I come home with it. Like there's no way I left at the airport and then you call them and it's like, it's not here. It was nowhere. I'm like, this has to be in my fucking house. And then 
dude two months went by i was looking like every single day i found it yesterday as soon as i fucking found it i remembered exactly what i did and i was like this <laughs> exactly was been out of my fucking memory for months and then as soon as i find it, i'm like oh yeah that's right fuck ah uh, maybe i think we probably slapped the ground a little a couple more times than the normal people so maybe yeah, that's it must be what it is uh speak the the boredom Frank. things uh the boredom thing's interesting though uh because like we're never bored now and uh i did uh i did like a pretty gnarly mushroom trip on the weekend and i just remember like i was just fucking nailed to my bed like i just i couldn't i couldn't get up like it was it felt like my ego was nailed to the wall and my body was nailed to the floor and they were like two separate (laughs) deals and i just remember like my dog was just like laying down chilling with me and my me and my dog both just like laying on the bed just fucking zonked and i was like this little cunt must be so bored all the time (laughs) like what i'm doing right now is like what this dog does like constantly and i was just thinking like there's like nothing it wasn't like i was bored it was that there was nothing to be done like i physically couldn't do anything and i could barely even think about anything so i just laid in my room dude it lasted like five hours of just like kind of being there doing nothing and it was actually like uh i guess that among the other things i kind of took from it was just like it's actually okay to just like lay down and chill you know like and and not even chilling in the sense of like watching tv or looking at your phone like literally nothing like you lay down and just do nothing don't sleep don't just be there because like that never fucking happens nowadays sounds like a waste of some good mushrooms mate (laughs) dude i uh nah there was like this wasn't one of those times you take mushrooms and you can actually go do shit (laughs) this was like one of those times where it was like over for me (laughs) (laughs) went a little went a little too hard no i kind of like those things i kind of wanted to go there to be honest i haven't i tried to do have you yeah. ever done one that's like a big one no nah. yeah so there's like wimp. yeah i want i just like wanted to do one like i tried to it was like a couple months ago i took like four grams and uh and they just i don't know i think i had them too long and they didn't really they just didn't really do much <laughs> so then this time i did four they grams got sour. To, yeah i did four grams and took like i didn't eat all day like i just did everything basically right but it was pretty fucking it was pretty fucking gnarly to be honest like i'm glad i did it but yeah it was definitely not a there was definitely nothing that could have been done in those four hours i just had to fucking wait wait it out (laughs) (laughs) ride that one out yeah it's Uh, fucking uh it's hectic dude it's hectic too like it just full comes in waves like there was you it felt like there was an hour where you were just like there was nothing like you couldn't do anything and then there was like an hour where you could i could get up and like use my phone i was like texting some friends being like damn i'm pretty fucked up right now and then another wave comes and you're just like a phone down like you're just fucking gone again <laughs> oh man good times huh yeah but we just don't we just don't get a chance to be bored these days and then i think like i think about how fast the last two years have gone like obviously you're in this like we're all in this like strange pandemic time and it just feels like two years was one it it went by that quickly yeah it kind of does and then like sometimes i think about it it does and then sometimes it seems like it's drug on so long because really that was the only time like say like february like march 2020 was boring like when (laughs) everything shut down and nobody knew what to do yet like nobody like and we all thought oh yeah this is this will just be like you know two weeks slow the curve or whatever right so yeah. two weeks to, to flatten the curve you know that was that was boring because then like nothing nothing was open i mean i i can't even complain australia had it way worse than us huh like for us we you know like north carolina south carolina like it was pretty normal like except for maybe like you know, up until summer of 2020 and then summer of 2020 came, they kind of reopened everything. And then they didn't like, even though other governments or like other States were shutting back down and doing all that, like North Carolina and South Carolina pretty much just let it ride for the most part. And so I was kind of lucky. I was, I was in a lucky place to be what, you know, 
where you guys it was it was real lockdown huh yeah like, i mean well you, we did we didn't have it that bad where we were like melbourne like victoria okay. they got they just got slammed they did like 250 but you couldn't oh yeah we couldn't leave the country like we, we couldn't really leave our state that much but in terms of like like there was people that literally dude 250 days in their house like not allowed to leave the house like you could do one walk you know per day and then like you could go get groceries and shit like that but it was just like done you couldn't leave imagine living in like an apartment and doing 250 days in an apartment like talk about fucking boredom and just in fear too like in fear Mm. something's gonna happen like if you're buying into everything that's going on like that's that's not a fun way to live man it's like luckily for me i just we were still able to travel state to state you know like i think for a while there was they kind of suspended flights for a little while um but you know for the most part it kept going and like i did so much traveling i probably seen more of the country the last mm. couple of years than I had in a long time. But, you know, uh, places that not like going to big cities. Like, I basically avoided all big cities, like the plague for the last couple of years. And I was just going into, like, Montana, you know, like, went riding in Utah, Idaho. Like, I, you know, did a lot of stuff. Like, at, in Oregon, we'd go find, you know, new swimming holes out in the middle of nowhere that, you know, Oregon's so beautiful. There's so many places to go. And, having everything shut down kind of opened up a whole nother world to me out there just so much you know waterfalls hikes different stuff that we could go do out there instead of going and just you know spending money at a shop somewhere it was uh it was kind of you know it just opened up the you know i I, like i said i probably seen more in the last couple years than i had in a long time just going out and and just avoiding people but going out and doing stuff yeah i think that was that was like a massive silver lining for so many people uh and it like it's been crazy for like just like economies and shit like that to have people yeah like you were probably going to towns and stuff where fucking nobody really goes but because you can't do like the standard shit um yeah you're just looking for like more cool places that you can kind of go within your own country and that was kind of the same for us with like when we drove to Manji, like that's 3,600 miles across, <laughs> across Australia. And like, dude, it was one of the right. dopest things I've ever done in my entire life. Like I just saw so much amazing shit and you kind of, uh, yeah, you can't help but take it in. It's like, what's, well, there's no, there's just like nothing really else to do, but just kind of be there and, and see this like new place you know it's and it's so out of routine as well that you are kind of taking it in because you know like how many flights have you done where you like you go into a city you know like you fly into chicago or something like that and it's just you're just not even really taking it in because it's probably like the fifth time you've been to that chicago airport and you just sort of you're just not even looking anymore well they all started look they all kind of look the same you know they're all the same layout for the most part you know just but yeah, that, that drive, that had been pretty wild. So you went from, where'd you go? From Gold, Gold Coast. Coast? Yeah. All the way to Perth? To Ma- yeah, to Perth, mate. Yeah. That Did you have to like drive down the bottom and yeah. loop around? Or is there like a straight shot? Nah, so like we drove. You can't just cut it. You have to like. Yeah, yeah. So we went from uh, Gold Coast. Then we went down through like Broken Hill, which is like country New South Wales. So like west of way west of Sydney, and then you go down through to like pretty much Adelaide, like down at the bottom, and then you get to uh, fuck Port Augusta, and then Port Augusta, then you go to Seduna, and then Seduna you go across the Nullarbor, uh, and then that takes you like directly into Perth. But the Nullarbor, dude, it's like a there's a uh, I think it's is it ninety miles or ninety kilometers? It's the longest straight road in the world. Like, it just doesn't turn at all. Doesn't kink, doesn't bend, nothing for fucking 90... It's either, like, 90 kilometers or 90 miles. And uh, so it's, like, an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes of just fucking dead straight. And the it's a trip because you get, like, cars that have their high beams on and you see the light. So then, you know, when the car's coming out, you kind of turn your high beam off. It's, like, fucking seven minutes from when you see a car's <laughs> headlights <laughs> to when you actually need to turn your high beams off. And it was crazy. Like we even t- 
turned the I turned the lights off completely in the van when we were on this straight road and uh after like a couple seconds the the stars were so bright out there that you could drive the car on this dead straight road with no lights on at like midnight that's wild did you have to like really plan out your gas stops like or is it uh is there quite a few like there's got to be a couple of points out there where if you don't fill up past this point you're kind of screwed right yeah we fucked up probably fucked up one time (laughs) Yeah, because it's not, it's just like Australia, everything's around the beach, right? Yeah. And there's hard, am I right? Yeah. And there's not much at all. It's like super desolate in the center, right? Yeah. So there was probably only like the three. Desert to get up. Yeah. So there was probably like three gas stations along the Nullarbor where we, well, there's, there's really, yeah, maybe like three. And then on the, we were sweet on the way there. We actually bought like a fuel drum and filled it with diesel and then put it in the van um but like one night coming back when we drove back uh we passed a a gas station and didn't fill up and then we just run out of fuel so like we had to we had to wait at a gas that we got to the next gas station that wasn't open until like 6 a.m in the morning so we only got to drive this one night where we're going to drive all through the night we only got to drive like four hours it completely cooked our whole trip and uh, so we had to just like sleep on the side of the road uh, at this gas station, wait, wait for it to open up so we could fill up. So yeah, there's just like literally nothing out there, dude. Do, do your Australian followers, do they know what gas station means? Yeah, you know, sure. I'd say gas station up <laughs> to me. Oh, oh, what? Oh, servo, mate? You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I <laughs> Where's actually, the gas station? <laughs> I forgot that you know what servo means. I'm just trying to gate up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cater cater to me over here yeah you're hey, practically a I remember just look, hey hey where's the, where's the gas station <laughs> people look at me so funny like oh you mean the servo mate uh, was, we we need to get you was, back uh, over we need to get you back over i i'd love to i'd love to i i always have the best time it sucks right when i you know, right when I yeah, came over there and, you know, got myself on uh, the CDR team, hanging out with Dak and the boys and doing good, putting it up on the box and the world has to shut down on me. Isn't this kind yeah, of that's, a bummer? That's some bullshit. But hope, you know, it's uh, this world supercross thing seems pretty cool. Mm. I mean, uh, I think everybody's kind of up in the up in the air on what it is, but that's just exciting that somebody's trying to promote something like that and it looks like they've got some kind of creative marketing ideas to to try to make it profitable for teams because you know supercross is expensive but it sounds like they got some cool ideas so what uh, you probably heard more about it than me i actually have literally heard nothing what have you heard well, i've seen all the instagram promos <laughs> that, that must be true no i i honestly haven't yeah. watched i watched like the video that they put out i kind of i kind of thought or well, i kind of knew a while ago like the first or before it even went to melbourne that that was sort of something that they were trying to do i heard years and years ago that bailey and sando wanted to do uh supercross in japan which i think would be insanely sick obviously four of the manufacturers um with an asterisk next to suzuki (laughs) four of the manufacturers are uh obviously japanese so i mean like the the culture of motorsport and the depth of you know the i guess like the general population's love for brands like yamaha and kawasaki and honda yeah it's just such like a crazy deep heritage and respect for the for those companies so i just feel like a race there would be insanely cool for the sport and there's so many places like that i mean do you look at what sport is like in um in the middle east you know they they froth on basically like any kind of sport that they can get obviously the um like motorsport is huge there just because they all can afford to drive fucking lambos and shit um so they're all just rev heads but yeah there's just so many dope locations around the world that i reckon would like really get behind that yeah, I mean, it'd be cool, too, just to have, you know, even just a secondary, you know, a second series going on, too. Like, you know, Supercross, I feel like, is getting more and more its own sport away from motocross. Like, mm. 
like and and it shows i feel like um you know when we go to like the jeep or you know the gps or the donations like those guys ride motocross all year train motocross eat breathe sleep motocross the u.s guys and like we eat breathe and sleep supercross like september rolls around it's supercross it's supercross all the way to may if you're not having the best supercross series maybe you spend uh you know you, you start back in april or something playing with outdoors but outdoors is an afterthought to the u.s you know so having you know the am you know the ama supercross series and then having a world supercross series is like a you know an option an option b to racing outdoors i think is pretty sweet and then you know maybe after a while you know they start to get a foothold in in different areas all it's going to do is just bring more attention uh, you know to supercross around the world i feel like i think it's going to be sweet maybe we'll even get some euro guys to try it out you know yeah it's uh i, I, don't I, know. I like the idea yeah, well, I, I like think, flying around racing dirt bikes in stadiums. Yeah, yeah I was cool. gonna say this is this <laughs> is a series that's literally built for you. Uh, so the, I think the the point that you made about motocross and supercross being pretty much like different sports these days. When did that fork in the road start? Because it's like for me, it's like they're the same thing for a long time, and then slowly it starts to separate. And I feel like now we're as far away from it as we've ever been like those two forks in the road they're they're kind of starting to get pretty pretty distant so i guess when do you think it really started to change like that and what are the factors that made that change you know well i i don't know i mean i think probably when you start, when Supercross started to get specialized, you know, like back in the like mid late nineties, like I don't, there wasn't like Supercross tracks everywhere. There wasn't Supercross training facilities. And then like in the last 20 years, it, it's just became, you know, even our bikes are so, you, know, you wouldn't even think about riding your outdoor bike on a Supercross track. It would just, mm. you know, it I used to every once in a while take out like a, a brand new stock bike and go ride on the supercross track and it was sketchy, but it was like kind of almost just like a pat on my back that I could do it and get through the whoops. It was yeah. cool, but it's so like, they're so different the way, like to go fast on a supercross track, your bike has to be so stiff and so specialized for that sport that when you get on an outdoor bike after riding a supercross bike for nine months, it feels so foreign it feels flimsy. Like it's just, there's so much difference to it. So I would say probably, you know, once Supercross started getting specialized, cause if you go back to like the, the nineties, you know, even like the mid nineties, like the tracks like Troy, Ohio were like almost just as super crossy as Supercross, but they were just more yeah. spread out. Yeah. And our, our outdoor tracks all would have like a super cross section. Like Glen Helen would have a super cross section. Washougal used to have jumps. Like, you know, rhythm sections and stuff everywhere. And for whatever reason, you don't see those super cross style obstacles in motocross anymore at all. It's all kind of the same jump and it's all about high speed. It seems like now and everything's real deep ruts and berms are frowned upon. Like it's like berms aren't motocross somehow. I don't know when that started, Yeah, but that's yeah, true. it just kind of seems like it's, yeah, like nobody likes berms anymore it's like if berms are sweet just put them further out wide so it's like if you want to take the inside rut that's super nasty and deep you can but then you can also blast the outside berm instead of everybody bottlenecking into one in one area i don't know why the, the berms became faux pas <laughs> nah. yeah i think uh yeah we're, we're heading in that direction like and probably who was the first to go supercross only was it james or was it chad no, McGrath. McGrath oh, was. But yeah. McGrath was such a badass. He would just show up and race an outdoor for fun. And like sometimes usually like he'd still like race the first two outdoor nationals on his Mazda Yamaha and like win. And then just like, yeah, all right. See you guys in January. You know? like, <laughs> see you later. Well, I'm um, going to have a suit. Yeah. See you guys later. Have fun. Uh, and then I guess Chad was probably the next one. And then James. And then... You know, I, I, I was on that 
train pretty early, almost kind of just by default, because I was, you know, James's teammate at San Manuel, and then RCH, their first year, they were Supercross only. Um, so that's why I did Supercross, and then I did X Games, and then I came to Australia that year and mm. rode for uh, Kale Wallace yeah, yeah. with the H&H, uh, the H&H clothing brand Suzuki. So that was, yeah. So, we, I, you know, I tried to stay busy, but I wasn't racing outdoors. And so do you think that, like, looking forward, do you think that, because uh, it's kind of been happening in a way, right? Like, Brayton was the probably one of the guys now that's made almost like a bit of a career. You you have as well, really, of like you do Supercross and then you spend the rest of the year just kind of like traveling around the world racing different supercross events that that you kind of can and we had it so good like we'd probably be in a pretty gnarly position if covid didn't happen um because you got like the australian series and then you've got the um new zealand round which was fucking rad and then the marvel event which was huge so it's like we've kind of lost two years of that i mean we're we're kind of it seems like we're just kind of heading in this unavoidable direction to where this series like really kind of makes sense and if you think about feel like just in moto in general people's like knee-jerk reaction when they see something like an announcement like this world supercross thing is like ah it kind of just probably won't happen but if you look at the the trend and what's been going on since like 2016 with the event in sydney and then moving it to melbourne like it's kind of been on course for this to be what happens and it seems like there's enough guys that are willing to support it yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Feld is the pinnacle of Supercross series. Like, you know, they get the best, they get the best riders, they bring it in. They have this, you know, the, the 25 point, you know, per weekend point structure, maybe it's 26 now. Uh, you know, they have this tried and true formula. Mm. But that said, if you went to a Supercross now and you went to a Supercross, like when I started in 2007 or 2008, there's not a whole lot of differences, mm. you know, like to the way the shows ran. I mean, if they've stuck to the exact same program and if you're like, you know, somebody that is traditional and likes that, it's great. Um, you know, I still like it. It still gives me goops, goosebumps when I go to a supercross and I'm either I'm racing or in the stands, it still gives me goosebumps. But when you go to these one-off supercrosses, like the Oz X open, you know, Paris, Geneva, you know, and then, you know, who knows what the next, you know, big thing is going to be, but they all, they all bring their own flavor to it. Mm. And, you know, the, the fans are so excited to, uh, to be there cause they only get it once a year that they're always, you know, they're so loud. They're so into it. You know, they'll, they'll have, you know, the freestyle shows that they have at Oz X open and at Paris. And I mean, they're world-class. It's like you get X, you get the best of X games and Supercross in one. Mm. And then if you're some, you know, horny old dude, there's hot chicks dancing, throwing flames and stuff in Geneva. <laughs> yeah, Geneva gets <laughs> weird. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, like there's just, there's just, you know, like Paris, they have that dude flying around on a, a like a hover craft thing. It's like a jet propelled, like board he stands on and he just flies around the stadium, which I don't know how they get away with doing that with insurance purposes, but it is the coolest thing. And I hope it never goes away except for, I know that the guys down the line for super pole were not pumped because he came whipping through on opening ceremonies and there's like Bogle and Reed and you know, all 10 of the super pole guys. I, I just missed top 10. So I wasn't in that crew. So I was laughing, but they come through <laughs> and that jet, uh, that jet pack guy comes through and like whips down and gets real low and hits this dirt patch and just blows like I mean it looked like a a hurricane came through and just blew all these dudes over goggles were flying off handlebars like it was pretty it was pretty funny but yeah I think that was the only casualty there it's, it's pretty sweet dude just whips around cruising around the stadium back and forth in like one second but just those little things like I remember when I was a kid watching like they had the robotic dinosaurs that would smash cars and stuff like I'd watch the terra firma videos when yeah. I was little and like those European supercrosses they bring a whole different vibe and a whole different you know it's a show where motocross is or supercross is like this tried true 
traditional format and European supercrosses, you get the head to head racing. Sometimes you get like the, you know, the bracket racing, you get, you know, all these different formats. They find a way to make the racing tight, no matter who's there. Mm. You know what I mean? So that, that's, I think that's, what's cool about it. And I, I mean, I completely agree. Like I remember when I first, the first year I went to Geneva, you were actually there that year. Um, and I remember the, I can't remember what year it was. It was when Axel went with you. Um, it was, I was like, like four, 14. Was it? When, I, when we had, when we got, we had Axel signing autographs of the monster thing and like yeah. nobody knew who he was yet. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. That was sweet. That was one of the drunkest I've ever been in my entire life, dude. Like I was fucking hammered that night, man. I remember, I remember I was up in, cause like the party closed down. Like there was like the big party in the, uh, in the, the car park there. And then I remember standing on like the top of that scaffolding place, ringing some fucking cowbell yeah. at like one, one in the morning or something crazy. I was looking all over for Axel because, like, I was kind of—I think Axel was only probably like sixteen yeah, he was or seventeen young, then. And like, I think I brought his other brother Austin to Paris with me because you'd always kind of get like this plus one on those trips. And uh, like, they had um, the Bud Racing guys had this mechanic for me named Searle that he was super—he was just really good. So I was dialed. I didn't have to bring anybody with me, and he was fun to be around. So I just bring my plus one as like a buddy. And uh, yeah, so I was like. You know, got the talk. Like, hey, you better, you know, keep an eye on him. He's, you know, he's, he's still a little boy, you know, <laughs> PH is giving me, yeah, you know, give me the talk. And then after the race, I don't, you know, I can tell he was having a good time, but then I don't see him. And I see like Edgar Torontes is doing his like, like beatboxing, yeah. like d- DJ in the whole party. Cause you're in that convention center and you basically you walk out of the, the race and you walk like a hundred feet and you're still inside that big building and they just have a massive party. And yeah, I couldn't find Axel anywhere. I was like, oh, great. Oh, this is terrible. I look up and I see him just like hanging from the rafters of the DJ booth, just throwing <laughs> it up next to Edgar. It's pretty funny. I think you must have been up there with him too. But yeah, I left. That was uh, a good time. I, I remember we went, because uh, it, it shut down pretty early. And then we're obviously everyone stays in that same hotel. And then I remember us all being back at the hotel and like just trying to get something to drink like to just keep the party going you know and then me and the uh the the dude that won the lights class he had like this smoke show french chick and uh, i was actually just telling tom you know about this the other day and uh he had this absolute like 75 out of 10 and uh we snuck into like the their room and he was just like anti-party and i guess and uh he had like that massive bottle of champagne from winning so we like grabbed that I bottle of champagne that. yeah and we we're like we're, i'm pretty sure it was your room i'd never <laughs> fucking smoked a cigarette in my life <laughs> i swear to god and this fucking french chick <laughs> had these bag of like little slim cigarettes and she didn't speak any english and i was just fucking so in love with this chick i just sat there chain smoking cigarettes and drinking champagne and then i remember i remember being in the i was staying with roger larson and uh i remember being in the hotel room the flight was at like six in the morning or something and i i remember this is before i knew i only had one kidney too and uh i was like throwing up in the shower completely naked all my camera shit was everywhere my bags weren't packed and roger larson's just like fucking kicking me dude like you have to get up and you have to do this i was like you need to get all my shit because like i'm fucking ruined right now and i remember being in the i remember being in the airport and like they had all the security guards with like the ak-47s and shit just like roaming around the the airport and i was like i wanted to fucking to make a scene or like steal something or do something that would get me shot by one of those dudes so that i could get like some morphine or something because i was hurting that bad (laughs) that's funny i think i think that's when axel secured his his seven deal was that weekend i think like he he showed like such a performance hanging out with everybody that like the seven dudes like we like this guy (laughs) <laughs> yeah that was, a, that, was uh, that was a good time that was those that, like it's just those those experiences you know you don't get those at, at ama supercross like sometimes you do like a lot of the back east ones like you just don't get those experiences at like anaheim mm. anaheim's like 
everybody goes to the race. Everybody's dead serious. Everybody lives around here. So they all go home. Like they all drive an hour home back to Temecula or back to wherever they live. And then like, it's, it's like the ones like Indianapolis, you know, yeah. That yeah. nobody's really from there. <laughs> and everybody's like, by that point of the series is kind of maybe thrown in the towel a little bit, figured out like <laughs> where they're at. And then they all start to let loose a little bit. Like, I mean, but it's still, it's not like, it's not like racing overseas. It's just a totally different, it's just a totally different atmosphere and it's to each their own, you know, but I still think that, you know, if with the right TV package and, you know, traveling the globe and getting, you know, bringing supercross around the world is that's, that's the dream, right? I mean, imagine if you had the, imagine if one day we had the, the Moto GP guys schedules or the MX GP guys schedules where we're just racing like once a month in a different country, racing supercross, flying and flying our bikes in, we're just cruising around living, you know, living like, like playboys yeah. out there. Just, you know, <laughs> well, I like think the, the GP guys see, like seem like they have a good time. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, that the reason for that, I guess, is that, I mean, New Zealand supercross, I think was, uh, the last one was probably like one of the coolest ones because there's no semis, there's no trucks, there's, there's no separation from the guys. Like you've kind of got your little box and then you've got your toolbox and your mechanic and like everyone's kind of forced to mingle. Then everyone stays at the same hotel. Everyone's kind of together and it kind of forces the, those barriers to be broken down a little bit because there's just so much less separation. It's like, okay, you got two choices. A, hang in your room by yourself or B, hang out with everybody else. And they just end up being so much more fun. Yeah, exactly. Like you're, you're, you're stuck in like locker rooms together. You know, yeah. like everybody's together everybody's hanging out and then you know like especially if you go to countries where you know people don't speak the same language you know yep. you kind of even the guys that you don't get along with like you kind of just you start hanging out with them even if they weren't your favorite person going into it and you know you guys start to find common ground it's just it's just fun it's different you know like i said for everybody you know there's going to be people who are like oh you know that's not ama supercross but then you know if it's marketed the right way with the right tv package and we're in all these really cool stadiums and you've got you know half of the top guys or you know even a quarter for the first couple of years like I think it's something that could really take off just because I think you know the the names that I've heard that are you know that are talking about being involved could they could pull it off so who are the names I'm, I can't say that <laughs> <laughs> I can't reveal my sources uh what yeah. uh what would you what would you like to see uh format wise like what do you think should because i guess like you are right like supercross is that tried and true format and it's hasn't changed in a hundred and fifty thousand years but i sort of don't think it needs to change that much i would i think for i guess we could make this a two-part conversation it's like what would we change for the amas to make that better and then it's like then what could we implement in a completely different way for like this world series because i think i think that there should be a like the super pole deal to like so you qual you do your normal practice and qualifying it like let's say a one and then the top ten goes out uh, right after opening ceremonies or it's like essentially a part of opening ceremonies in a way is like you bring out the top ten dudes and then they get to throw down their heater in front of the crowd it's on TV I think that. I, I could just think of like a hundred verticals where that's like really great for the sport. Like you think about it's one dude that's got that branding on TV for, you know, 58 seconds or whatever. It's like, there's something super tangible that, that sponsors can take. Like, Hey, Kenny is in the main event every single weekend. That's 60 seconds of TV time guaranteed with Red Bull, with Honda, with blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's something that we don't like. You can't as a sponsor take that, uh, as a team take that to a sponsor um and then i think yeah that should pay points because then it really does mean something you've got no one mailing shit in um so i mean as far as i guess that's probably like my one thing that i would like to see a little bit more of but it's like i don't think we need to change supercross that much but then i think with this world thing then there's a chance to kind of like do some different cool shit but so i guess first part of the question like what would you change at the ama level to make it better Mm. the AMA level I don't think like I think that their their program works for them mm. I think it's 
I, I got, I, yeah, some people like the triple crown. Some people don't. I think that, you know, they're, that's kind of like the only thing that they've really explored with, like trying new things is the triple crown. And some weekends it, it makes for exci- super exciting racing. And then some weekends it makes for, you know, a runaway. And then you're just doing math problems to see who's in second or third or fourth. You know, it's yeah. kind of just, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it, the, the triple crown. But I, I mean, I think that their format's pretty good. Um, Super Pole would be cool. Like you said, having having that opportunity to to showcase your sponsors on national TV every time if you're a top 10 guy, like being able to get out and do that. I think that's I think that is a good idea. And I, you know, if it did pay some points, I'm sure it would ruffle some feathers if that was being, you know, brought up as something that they wanted to do. I'm sure there would be some pushback, but at the end of the day, if it was, you know, if it meant something, you got national, you got TV time for it. And then, you know, you couldn't be too mad at it. Uh, but like you said, I think that the world supercross stage is the stage where we can experiment with what works. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, and I'm not convinced that we really need 20 guys on the track at the same time to have mm. a good race. You know, like it's a lot of people to have on a track that isn't that wide. I almost wonder, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to see like, you know, almost uh, like tighter qualifying to a to a less filled final because you know when you start there's really not a weekend where you know they don't lap to like 14th you mm-hmm. know what I mean so if you had only 14 I, I don't know and I'm this is coming from a guy that's just on the cusp of making main events these days <laughs> so I'm like I'm cut I'm cutting myself off at the legs but I, I almost wonder if that could be something that would could be safer for the riders and make the racing better you mm-hmm. know if a guy you know, you know, a bad start is not, tw- you know, 24th and you're 22nd anymore. You know, it's 14th is the last place on the gate. You know, that's already, that's mid pack basically. I don't know. Just, I think that with the world supercross stage, they'll, they'll be able to, you know, try out all these different things. And that, that could be what, you know, keeps people's attention, uh, keeps people's attention to the, you know, to the new series while maybe they don't have every top rider involved. You know, until they, they start to draw those guys in, they can play with these, you know, different, different ideas and come up with some new ex- and exciting racing formats. But I think, you know, yeah, the Super Bowl, I think the head to head races are so fun. I yeah. miss the European head to head races. They get so dirty, but they're so fun. And I mean, and you only have to worry about one guy. It's like, you know, you kind of know, okay, this guy's close enough. He's probably going to try to just go for my, go for my knee right here. I got to either check up or yeah, you know, that it's just fun. I think that, you know, even I'd like to even see something like four guys at once, mm. you know, and like go down like quarters would be kind of cool. Yeah. Like, I think, I uh, know. yeah, I'm dude, I'm, I'm definitely, you've got me thinking about the, uh, that whole like smaller main events. Cause it, there's probably a bunch of unintended consequences that that would have that would probably be for the better like more racing because i mean yeah there's like 20 guys going into a first turn is a lot like that you just instantly like the spacing from the front to the back gets it just gets so spaced out so quick but if you've got say like 12 dudes six guys either side of the gate then it's like it's a lot more room you're gonna have like that that bunch like the entire field is gonna pretty much be on like the same straightaway for quite a bit longer like you see nowadays you're probably going into the first turn by the third straightaway you've probably got riders over that spread over two straightaways and it's like you're just not really going to make up that time and then there's like the i guess the passing implications of being around so many guys like and you got to think about if you're let's say you're sixth in a um in a race versus say 12th in a main now the lap time that you can turn in that kind of traffic is so that's probably like seconds different right yeah totally i mean it's just it's just bunched up it's it's a traffic jam one guy doesn't do an obstacle or one guy thinks a guy's not going to do an obstacle then you know if everybody's smart they don't do that obstacle behind you but if they do you start landing on people it just gets bunched up i mean it's a lot of bikes to be on the track and uh, you know I don't, I think the tracks might've gotten skinnier too. Like mm. when I watched the old races, like from, you know, late nineties or, you know, 
yeah, late nineties, early two thousands, I feel like the tracks had were wider in a lot of areas where they're, they're just, you know, and the bikes are going faster. Like it's just, we've, we've, the bikes have evolved so much and then the, you know, there's only so much real estate on the course. So, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing, I, I think it would be safer for the guys to have less riders. And I don't think it would take anything away from the fans. It's the, you know, the worst place, you know, your favorite rider goes down in the first turn, you know, he gets up and he actually still has a legitimate chance at winning where, mm. you know, th- that's really not the case anymore right now with, with, with all those guys. I mean, somebody can have a heroic comeback and come up to third or fourth or something like that. But if you go down in the first turn, it's over, you know? I feel like in, you know, if you have a, you could change the way the tracks are built too. If you had less guys, you know, you could make the tracks a little bit gnarlier, a little bit more technical. You could, you know, create, you know, different obstacles that, that could evolve the sport into what mm. were, you know, what these bikes are capable of doing if you had less bikes on the track, but you don't want some hundred foot triple out there when there's 22 guys on the track. Like yeah. It's, you know, cause somebody's not going to do it in the mid pack. And then, you know, you just got to pray that the guy behind you like sees you check up. So, but that's, like I said, I think you try those, this world stage could really, you know, set the stage for, for the, these new ideas to, to evolve the sport and you'll figure out what works, you know, at, at these events. And then maybe one day the, the AMA series would want to implement it yeah. or maybe this, you know, maybe this series just takes off and it becomes its own thing, you know? It's uh, which it's, I'm sure it will. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. And I mean, I guess we're we're seeing it through the eyes of like knowing what AME is capable of because we've obviously both been at a bunch of these these events. Like we're converts, you know. Like there's, I guess they don't have to convince us of what they can pull off. Um, and I think the other thing, man, like you look at like MotoGP and Formula One. Like there's a lot of like Middle Eastern money. There's a lot of like government money that kind of comes into things and to to hold a gp like i'm kind of speaking out of school here but i think it's like it's like a couple hundred grand or like a few hundred thousand euros that you've got to kind of like put up to have an mxgp event um and i guess like that's probably the thing that feld's kind of got on lock is like they're obviously like this massive company that's like got all the revenue behind them they've got the sponsors locked locked in it's just like a dialed in kind of program there's no like real new money that's kind of hitting the sport um from that sense but it's like there's a lot of places a lot of countries that pay big dollars to have sporting events and you've got like these rich ass fucking sheiks that are in you know like the middle east that you know they've got stadiums they've got the population and they just don't have like the you know the world-class events and if you look at like formula one is massive for it moto gp is massive for it uh and then the ufc is massive for it um especially through like the pandemic stuff too you know the ufc was like the one sport that kept going because abu dhabi just let them do what the fuck they wanted to do like they built them a fucking island to fight on um so i mean that's kind of like a, a crazy possibility too is that like we might actually see new money come into the sport for the first time in a while yeah i mean that that would be great i mean the you know the energy drinks really kept us afloat for the for a mm. long time you know like the the millions that all the energy drinks are putting into it but hopefully there'll be a new you know a new wave of sponsors come in and just you know generate some new attention and like like we said just going to different parts of the world and and growing the sport there is it's going to do nothing but just help the sport in a whole you know somebody's somebody's going to see this sport you know and w- whether it's and, and i know they've done it in japan before but i don't think they've really ever done it big in the middle east which i've you know there's been grumblings that that could be where where they might want to do some of these world supercrosses which you know I, i've never spent any time over there but it seems like it could be it could be cool especially if uh if the government, like you said, is into it, it could be really cool. Um, you know, just to put, put Supercross on that stage would be great. And, and, you know, just, int- I think it's one of those things that in America, it's Supercross is kind of a big deal. Like, especially in Southern California where they have five rounds, normally five rounds a year. I mean, you go to the local grocery store, there's prom- there's promotions for it everywhere mm. you go. You know, people are talking about it and, you know, it's, it's just really cool to see. It would be great to, to have that kind of atmosphere in, in different countries that, you know, okay, every, 
every year around this time, you know, this is coming into town and it's a, it's a big thing. So hopefully, hopefully it catches on. It'd be, it would be great. It'd be nothing but great for everybody. You'll be there. Maybe they'll even let us like, you know, try, try new bikes out there, like electric bikes and stuff, you know, and see, yep. you know, if they, if they need a gimmick, dude, I'll pull up on an e-bike, see if I can hang. Yeah, you will. <laughs> um, the I think the one thing too, I want I wanted to just circle back to the uh, to the top ten shootout deal is we we got a problem in the sport right now uh, in the sense that like we were talking about, there's probably ten guys that can win, probably five or six guys that can win no matter what, like no matter whether they got a good start or bad qualifying or whatever, they could just win the race. And then there's probably like another five or six guys where if a few things go right, then they could win. But the reality is there's three dudes on the podium every single weekend. So you've got all of these guys that are like right there. Like there's a bigger group than we've ever had, but there's only three spots on the box, which means there's only three spots that people actually give a fuck about. And I think that that's kind of like one of the problems that we've got in our sport is that there's no way to celebrate these other dudes that are like just as good, but don't manage to get on the podium on that particular weekend. So I think that if you look at, you know, doing like a televised top 10 shootout, then the incentive to be, I guess, like the value of being a top 10 rider goes up. Like it's not the factories just they get another reason. There's like another incentive, you know. Like it, it becomes like uh, like you hear in like Formula One. Oh, there's two two Mercedes on the front row, or there's two Ferraris that are on the second row. It's like it's more about the the top ten or like and you know you look at the way that they do qualifying. They like, they drop five guys out and then they drop another five guys out. And if you make that last session of qualifying then you're getting some like really good TV time and there's points. So people actually care. So I just think that in terms of like, like what do we do with these other guys that are so fucking good, but they just don't get shine, you know? Uh, And I think that if you go to like a televised top 10 shootout, um, you know, maybe you got to drop a fucking, like maybe we don't get to see the, the lights lcq maybe the 450 lcq is the only one we get to watch but it's like you know you've got this chance to give these guys some really legitimate shine in the sport that they're just not going to get otherwise i mean you could probably bust out the whole super pool you know if we're stealing it directly from europe like you could pretty much bust out the whole super pool thing as an opening ceremonies kickoff Yeah. yeah you know if they wanted to if they wanted to do it it's just, it's just whether or not, you know, you can, you know, I think how it works here, not that I'm like, you know, super in the know, but I've heard that you, they, you know, they, they get all the, the heads together of these companies, Feld does, and out of respect, they, they run by these, all these ideas by the companies to see what they want, you know, because they're, at the end of the day, Feld gives us a platform, but nobody's making money without the manufacturers, you know, mm-hmm. like the bonuses are all coming from the manufacturers and all your sponsors, like you make twelve thousand dollars to win a 450 main event you make thirty five hundred dollars to win a lights main event you know you're making way more money in bonuses than that but that's coming from the manufacturers so they still have a lot of say in what's going on so you know they're gonna have to sit down and and you know try it, it's not like feld can just be like hey we're gonna do this you know take it or leave it i mean i guess they could do that but that's not really how they they've seemed to roll you know, like they try to run run these ideas by by the manufacturers. And I don't know if they've ever ran that one by the manufacturers or not, but I'm sure it just kind of has to go through that process and making the guys go out and go for broke for points for a single lap final. You know, Bruce at Kawasaki and and you know Jim Roach at Yamaha and all those guys. They might not sign on for that idea of hey, we you know we're going to take our you know, prized investment and make him put up or shut up on, you know, (laughs) when he's cold for opening ceremonies to get 10 points, you know, like they may not like that idea. So that's, that's what you're kind of up against. But on these, you know, like, like we were saying, the world supercross stage, you can try all this until the fans demand it, you know, like you put on these, these super poles and you show how cool it is. Or maybe you start doing these head to head races and then, you know, the fans start to 
start to demand it, I guess would be the only, you know, I think that's kind of how you get the, you, you get the change made, right? Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, the electric bikes before, uh, let's, let's fully break down the stock. Let's like, <laughs> let's break down the whole experience of, uh, of going over there. First of all, real recognize real because they fucking called your boy they obviously knew who the e-bike god was uh of of this (laughs) two-wheel industry and that that is big hill uh so yeah like how did the whole process go down and when did you first get the call i mean i know we spoke a couple weeks before it came out and like you were still under nda and you couldn't uh give away info so i mean you you were obviously like sitting on that um but how long was it and like when did you kind of get the first call and how did it all go down i've been uh basically you know me and eric pernard worked together on the the alta project um eric was i guess like a consultant for for alta you know him and then um dave arnold who was at factory honda and factory ktm for years like they were kind of lobbying to try to get the alta into into you know racing ama racing and you know they were working together on you know just eric was very involved in alta so we had a you know a good relationship we've known each other from years eric is you know basically the guy that organizes bercy in geneva to bring the american guys over and just an all-around great guy works for fox you know europe and the u.s i think and just all-around great guy and when alta crumbled um eric was like i'm gonna keep my eyes out electric isn't dead it's just a bump in the road and I said yeah I'm gonna do the same and you know we've always I've kind of just kept scouring the internet trying to find any you know any company that's coming out with something new in the electric world because I just think electric bikes are just so fun like I know I catch a lot of flack online from people that just act like I don't know what a dirt bike is or something and they're like (laughs) what are you riding that thing for like you know everything has its its own purpose you know but I love electric bikes. And anyways, Eric kept his, kept his ear to the ground and, and found out about the Stark project. And, you know, he did the, he did the digging and, and, you know, realized it was going to be real, real, uh, legit. And he's the one that connected us together and, you know, got me to come, you know, started talking, you know, had a, we, we talked pretty much this whole year leading up to this and, I was supposed to go out there in July and it just kind of kept, you know, just all worked out to where I was out there for Paris Supercross and just yeah. went out to Spain and tested the bike for a week with Sebastian Tortelli. And it's, uh, it's badass. It really is like, uh, it's a badass bike. It's, I mean, we were so prototype on it too. When we pulled up, like you know, they, they just started riding it like the week before we got there. And that's how good it was, you know, like their, their measurements, their calculations, the way they engineered that thing was so tight, like it, that it didn't like, you know, we, we, we had this, you know, we had input and, you know, worked on some things and, you know, tried to change a few different things, but you, I could not believe how good it was out of the box. So that's their first try at it. That's their first swing. Like imagine what they're going to come out with in the future. It's, it's gotta be cool, man. Electric, like it or not, there's going to be a day probably in the next 10 years when you're out there ripping on your 450 and something just comes whistling by you, you know what I mean? And you know, somebody that you usually beat gets on one of these things and just blows by you because they're going to be lighter. They're going to be faster and they're going to be easier to ride. So for some people that's going to take away the fun, but you know, it's just, it is what it is. We got it. We got it's, it's development. Things are growing. I mean, and I, I think everybody is all wrapped up in the noise. Like, Oh, it sounds like crap. Like if you ride one, it doesn't sound like crap. You can hear yourself think you can mm. hear your, you can, <laughs> you can hear like your tire breaking loose. Like if you're, you know, you can't hear that on a, on a 450. you just, Argh! you know, like you don't know what's going on. You can actually hear exactly what your tire is doing. If you're skidding, if you're perfect traction if there's a rock if there's something hard like if you're riding with your friends like you can speak like we're speaking right now and communicate like you know it's just it's fun you can sneak up on wildlife like nobody even knows you can hit a hundred foot double on the backside of a business and you know something that you people hear you coming from a mile away like you just have this type of fun that by the time they get there they see you do it they think they're seeing things i mean it's just there's a lot of possibilities with electric 
And I definitely don't want to, like, I'm not the guy that's like, oh, I'm doing this for the environment or I'm doing, it's all, you know, yeah. we're riding dirt bikes, right? Like, you know, I don't think that we're huge polluters riding dirt bikes. I mean, we're I burning agree. like, you know, what, what three gallons of gas in a, yeah. in, a, in a whole day of fun. I mean, <laughs> it's not much. So, you know, and these electric bikes, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe they are a step in the right direction to, you know, to go towards a greener, you know, a greener setup and be less pollutive. But what I think it is, is just less offensive to people that don't like motorcycles and so user friendly to people that don't know anything about motorcycles because there's literally zero maintenance. When I say zero maintenance, like my Alta before it got stolen, like a month ago or two months ago, whenever it was, like that thing had probably 700 hours on it, if I had to guess. Wow. And it was as fast as the day that I got it. Like all you do is tighten the spokes and the chain. I mean, it, and it was even, you know, throwing codes like, hey, you're supposed to have this thing serviced. You know, like I was supposed to do stuff, but it, it's just, it's crazy how efficient they work. And they're the same, whether you're at 10,000, you know, if you're at, at, at Aspen at 8,000 feet, or if you're at sea level, like your bike is going to run the same. It's just, it's so user-friendly. I'm sure those peewee parents that are getting those KTM and Husky and gas, gas, little, little electric bikes are loving life, not having to work on spark plugs and clutches <laughs> and all the little stuff that goes wrong. Some people love toying with that stuff. And, but I mean, it's just going to be user friendly. I think that it's going to bring in a whole new batch of people that didn't know anything about dirt bikes to enjoy them. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm all, all in like there's, there's zero part of me, but I mean, I'm all in on like the mountain bike e-bike thing. We've already, you know, for anyone in moto that's like, it wants to follow along this storyline go to vital mtb or pink bike and just like read articles about how fucking good e-bike mountain bikes are and like what that's done for the industry um of mountain biking and like for me i don't really ride mountain bikes that much anymore like there was a time where i do like 100 k's a week in the trails on my on my mountain bike but it's like that dude's fucking gone and if I want to go and have a social ride now with like any of my friends on a fucking acoustic, then it ain't happening. Like I just pretty much like ride my mountain bike to get milk now. But on an e-bike, like we went and did, uh, we, we flew down to Derby uh, in Tasmania. It's like some of the most badass fucking trails in the world. And I rode in four or three days of riding. I did 100 Ks of trail. There was one day I did 50 Ks in, in a day and, uh, which is probably, you know, like 24, 23 miles. And, uh, granted I run the battery out and have to pedal it normally for a while. But, um, but yeah, it was just like the possibility that having this like electric assistance gave to me as just like the average punter. It's like, you can copy and paste that into, into moto as well. You know, like, I feel like the the sensation of riding it is the same but in terms of the impact and like the implication of all these different i guess little like side variables of like this will allow more people to ride this will allow people to ride for longer it just it like removes all of these barriers to entry so like for anyone that is a hater on electric it's like go and see what it did for the mountain bike industry and it was the same thing there you know like you get the same people that uh, complain and say like oh it's not core it's not this it's not that but it's like you just think about it as like it's a net negative uh, it's a net positive for the industry you know like not a net negative yeah for sure and like the, I mean just for me whatever is going to be the most reliable and the most make the most sense you know like you know how many times I've gotten hurt because a engine parts broke on a bike and things seized up and locked up on me like if we've got something that's much more efficient in that sense, that right there's enough for me to want to ride these things. You know what I mean? Like I've you know had so many times a bike lock up and just a, the wrong situation and just ruin my day or, or ruin my month or yeah, year, months, you know, like, yeah, yeah it, it's, 
you know, so if these things are more efficient, which I, you know, they're not, the Alta was, the Alta was awesome. And I think that that technology is just more efficient. It seems like, you know, like the, and what you can get out of them and the way you can tune it, like you can buy one bike and you can tune it. You could have it be as slow as a 125, or you could have it be snappier than a 450. It's whatever you like. It's one size fits all. You ride it, you try it out. There's there's an app in you know in your handlebars. It comes with a smartphone that you can just type in whatever you want your bike to run like. And you know if you want to you want to go for a ride and you want full power, and then you want to give it to your wife and you want to let her go have fun, like you just you know dial it down a little bit and it's good to go. But I think like. Electric is going to change our actual, what we think a dirt bike is. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see more and more of these mountain, like mountain bike moto hybrids because we're going to be able to pretty soon, you're going to get something that with the same power as a 125 that weighs like 125 pounds. Mm. That's going to be really wild. Imagine <laughs> the freestyle tricks. Yeah. Imagine like the stuff that you're going to be able to do like in the streets. Like, I mean, if your bike is only a hundred, hundred pounds, 125 pounds, you can lift those things up on the roof of something. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like the, the street riding, like just the, everything is going to just continue to grow. Like the, the, that Kuberg bike that I ride thing only weighs like maybe 115 pounds and goes like 55 miles an hour. Yeah. Sure. Like there's, you know, they're not really built with the intention of doing the things that I want to do on them. So sometimes, you know, like I'll push the limits and break some stuff here and there, but they're starting to catch on that. Oh, Hey, maybe we should build a bike with the intentions of doing these type things. Yeah. So uh, there, there's so many new little startup e-bike companies that I think motocross is going to, it's going to be exciting. There's going to be so dirt biking, maybe not motocross, motocross, the sport, you know, it's, that's probably should stay gas for a little while, but dirt bike riding is I think on the cusp of blowing up and really changing form with electric bikes because there's going to be, you're, you're going to get on Instagram one day and some dude's going to have some goofy bike that you'd never heard of. And he's going to be doing something really cool that mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't see coming. Maybe he had as a BMX background or, you know, a mountain bike background, like that type stuff's going to start happening. And that's kind of what I'm, you know, that excites me the most about, about these e-bikes. It's going to open up whole new possibilities because we're so used to a 250 pound bike and that being the standard. Mm. But if you can start getting, you know, 40 horsepower and something super, super light, that's going to be fun because mm. the lighter the bike, the softer you land, the more agile, you know, it's until you start getting under a certain level. Yeah. It's going to be sweet. I, I think too, I mean, if you look at like everywhere, you just like moto just gets pushed further and further and further and further and further out of town. And uh, like, you know, there's places where it's like an hour and a half from my place to drive there. And they're still fucking battling with noise. So it's like, okay, the the moto thing like the with a motor and gas and noise it's like we're getting fucked and urbanization isn't gonna slow down so it's like <clears throat> how long what in two years how far do i have to drive if right now it's at a year if, if it's in an hour and a half to just get to a track and it's just like we're in uh i guess we're just like living in this slow burn where we kind of don't even really see it happening but it's like yeah there's going to be a couple years to go by and like we've got to drive three four five hours just to go and ride a dirt bike whereas like the, one of the gyms that i do jujitsu at right there's like they're in these big warehouse buildings and then there's like this fucking parkour warehouse where all these kids rock up and up the school and do fucking parkour <laughs> and it's a, dude i've that seen nuts though Bro, I see more ambulances at this fucking parkour gym than at the motocross track when I go on. <laughs> like, it is out of control. You'll be, like, rolling, and then you'll hear some kid fucking scream because they've just broken their femur on this <laughs> fucking parkour oh. thing, dude. It's hectic. But it's, like, that warehouse, there's nothing to say that, like, right now I couldn't buy one of those warehouses and get 10 KTM 50s 
And then you've just got class times, like exactly the same as these kids are rocking up to do parkour or jujitsu after school. It's like, hey, you go to the moto club and then, you know, little Johnny rocks up and he's got his 50 and like you just bring your gear and you drop your kid off and there's a place for the parents to sit. And then you've got like the instructor that's uh, like, all right, guys, get warmed up. Everyone do three laps and, you know, just ride how you want to ride. And it's like, okay, today we're going to do this. And then it's like at the end, then it's like, all right, we're going to do a 10 lap race now. And you could have kids that are going to like these after school team sport type environments but it's like just on a ktm 50 you don't even have to bring your own bike you don't have to do nothing and then there's like the intermediate class which is on you know the bike that you're talking about where it's like that mountain but more hybrid mountain bike type deal it's like we're not gonna have to go hours now to uh these tracks and it's like a kid a kid that uh you know like you said before you kind of motocross is kind of like a fraternity or dirt bikes is like a fraternity you've got to kind of like know someone that's in it but it's like nowadays you know you can really just get these kids where they don't want to play football or they don't want to play baseball it's like hey i want to just try ride a dirt bike and mum and dad aren't going to go and have to buy one they can just go where's like the dirt bike place in town and then every town's got like three or four of these like warehouse facilities that's got tracks in it and then you just buy your kids some gear you can rent it at the thing they have like a pro shop like a golf a golf deal so and then imagine now that we've got like the stock imagine then you go there and there's like 10 of those things there and you can rent those bad boys out it's like it's a such a game changer for the sport in in uh in terms of just like accessibility as well that i just don't think can be understated yeah i mean i think it's going to take a little bit of a different it could take a different form too you know like we don't have to make dangerous motocross tracks but to have fun you know i think you could almost make you know like you said especially like like oregon washington minnesota like all these really cold places yeah. You know, the, the Northeast, like you could just get an indoor place. You'd have music pump and the heater going. You don't yeah. have to worry about ventilation. And you basically just take that go, that go-kart track motto. You know what I yeah. mean? Where you pull yeah. up, they got 20, they got 20 bikes or your 30 bikes in rotation. One comes off, they get plugged in, you yeah. know what I mean? And they just, they go out and you have like a Astro turf track, you know, like artificial grass track over the top of some little wood jumps and you could make berms off the walls and just kind of like a safe, fun course. And then you got transponders to try to race your buddies. I mean, I'm sure the liability of it's going to be higher than a go-kart track, but, um, you know, I think that it could definitely introduce people and just make a new fun environment. And there's going to be so many different forms of little e-bikes. It's going to be crazy. And it's kind of, it's almost cool that the that the big like the big four or five are kind of fighting it and not letting mm. it, and not trying to come out with come out with something new you know because i don't think they want to give up those selling clutch plates and pistons and mm. uh, you know just all the stuff that goes along because think about how much you, you buy a dirt bike and then you know you ride it for two hours and then you got an oil change and then you got you know you got about what six to ten or about ten hours you probably might start thinking about a clutch and then about 25 hours you're gonna start thinking about a piston Mm. and you know the oil filters you know air filters like there you know there's a whole lot that goes into it and not that you know honda yamaha you know know, the top manufacturers ktm not that they're making all the money on the aftermarket but i'm sure that uh or you know on the on the spare parts but yeah, I mean, I, and and just the servicing on them and stuff like that, where there's not going to be a whole lot to service on these electric bikes. Like, I mean, maybe something will be faulty, and then you'll have to reach out and get a new. You know, I'm I'm talking worst case scenario. Then you have to reach out and get something sent to you, and maybe in the first few years of that, maybe there'll be some hiccups like that. You know, playing devil's advocate here. Yeah. Maybe you know that you'll have to contact. And be like, hey, send me. You know, this is faulty send me a new new one of these you know like flux capacitor whatever it is on. <laughs> you know? yeah but it's going to be like a firmware but, update it's not going to be like a, a you got to pull exactly. the motor out and you got to fucking split cases and shit yeah it's it's just gonna and i'm i am worried about you know like just like 
the guys over at Twisted Development were giving me a hard time the other day at Anaheim. He's like, stop making those electric bikes look cool. And, you know, I get where he's coming from. And, but I, I, don't, I don't see any time where you know, electric is just going to completely take over. You know what I mean? Like, I think you're always going to want to have that, you know, you're always going to want to have that gas bike for certain yeah. things. Yeah. You know, like the electric, you know, no matter how cool a, a Tesla car is, like, it ain't that cool if you're trying to travel across the country. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're, yeah. you know, if you're out in the desert, you're, if you're desert riding, like electric ain't really going to be your go for a real long time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's even, even, you know, like I think supercross is kind of a cool format for electric bikes. So that's, that's the most enticing one, right? Cause yeah. 20 minutes isn't that long. I think that where they're at now, the battery should be pretty close. The power should be pretty close to a 450. So, you know, hopefully one of these days I can get to try that thing out, you know, even just as an experiment against, uh, against these, the big four fifties. I mean, and, and let's be honest, like I'm not in the shape of, of these top guys, nor am I as good or fast as these, these top guys are, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I've got the timing and maybe I could do certain things, you know, on par with them. But if you give me a bike, that's, let's say the the Starks way better than the four fifties, right? We're, you know, not saying that it is, but I'm just saying, just what if I'm still going to, what am I going to do? Get 14th instead of 17th. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I'm the perfect guy to go test that, test that thing out against this, this competition. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more, man. What's the, out of curiosity, like if I was to go and buy a bike that I could ride right now, like what's the coolest e-bike that you can have? Just taking away the stock because that's not delivered yet. I don't, I, I, there's nothing out. Like the Kubergs are like the coolest thing that you can, the Kuberg, uh, Ranger is like, it looks funny cause it's got that little rear wheel, but it's got pretty good mountain bike suspension and it goes like 55 miles an hour. You can lift it with two hands into the back of your truck. Like you ride it in a hotel, like Molly would take it to like meetings and just ride it straight in the elevator of the building that she was going to have, like <laughs> sit down with her backpack on and her computer. Like they're super uh, like unoffensive like cops don't say anything about them that i've seen like i've ridden by I, I rode those things to and from the hotel at x games by 30 cops every time and they would just like look at it and go, oh that thing's cool you know i think if you're disrespectful on these e-bikes and you're not being like you're not going all out 55 miles an hour like being kind of a jackass i think that you get away with a lot on these things there's kind of a gray area at least in the states on what you can do but as far as the dirt bike, like nobody's like, I've seen, there's like a Chinese dirt bike that's electric out. That looks like a 2016 Honda 450. Uh, but I don't know. I have no idea what it's like when you ride it. And I don't, I've seen a few different ones. There's, there's a company in Germany that looks kind of cool, but I don't, you know, I don't know what, are they the I ones that are running the Yamaha? I don't think any of the them. Yamaha? No, there's Yamaha Europe is working on something that looks pretty cool but i haven't it's not like an in-house yamaha thing yeah. i think it's yeah um, it's a different company right i think it's like a company like i think yamaha europe gave some other company like a bunch of bikes to try to develop something and see what they come up with is that's how i understand it but again i'm not really that in the know with what's going on with the yamaha development but yeah i mean really your best bet is to get a varg <laughs> Like, yeah. just go put a hundred bucks down on one of those things and hopefully you'll have it by the end of the year. Cause I don't like, you know, an Alta good luck finding one and, uh, everything else. Like, I, I, I don't know what's, I mean, I seen those K, I seen a KTM free rider the other day in the bike shop and it looks, it looks kind of cool, but it doesn't, I don't, I don't know. It looks kind of funky. Like the ergonomics mm. on it don't look like a real dirt bike. Yeah. It I looks seen like a ta- or, uh, max. Max Volan made it look cool though. He put like a he put eighty like an eighty front end on it or something. Yeah, right. And stiffened up the suspension. It looked like a little bit, and he was like whipping around, like making it look really fun in one of his videos a long time ago. But other than that, it has never really looked enticing to me. How yeah. um how much is that? What what's it the one that the with the little back wheel? What are they called? They're called uh, Kuberg Rangers. How, Kuberg mean, is the name of the company. They're like K U B E R G. Yeah. 
Ranger. I'm and then uh, my buddy, my buddy imports them. So that's how like, we, like one of my good friends knew a guy that was importing them. And then, you know, we just be all became friends. And uh, when they first brought them over, they had the, it was a Kuberg free rider and it was a really cool concept, but it was like even faster than this one because, but it only weighed like 78 pounds. <laughs> so it was like, it was scary, man. Like the stuff would, it would go so fast and you could go so big that it wasn't built for yeah, yeah. as big as you could go. And like <laughs> stuff would start flexing. Like you'd throw a chain on a jump face, like just because like it was fast enough and had good enough suspension to do it. But everything else in between there wasn't quite there. But that new Ranger is, it's a hands down one of the funnest bikes ever for just like, exploring around riding around on trails like you can pretty much take it on mountain bike trails and nobody's gonna unless you're being disrespectful and skidding and you know trying to burn out like nobody's gonna really say anything to you yeah. unless they're just pissed because you passed them and you're not pedaling yeah yeah <laughs> like they're, they're pretty um they're pretty they're super fun and they're just you like i said ride them by cops and they just kind of look i mean don't you know, don't quote me and say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't go not being held liable here. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> from experience, from experience, yeah. uh, I haven't been hassled on them at all. So that's kind of the the cool thing about them. They're kind of this gray area of people don't know what to do about them. Is uh, what's the retail on those things? Do you know? I think in the U.S., like you can get you can get like the the base model for like six, like sixty five hundred or something like that. I think. Yep. So, I mean, they're, they're steep, a little bit steep. Um, you know, I get they're I mean, pit bikes are going for like four grand now. So yeah. it's a little bit more than a pit bike, but it's like a pit. You don't have to do anything to it though. Once you get it, um, it's got air forks. And I mean, the one thing you, I guess you could maybe some people have beefed up the shock that probably helps. Like there's like a Fox shock option. I think you can get, Yeah. but aside from that, you just, you don't really need to do anything. And the wheels have held up better than like most other ones that I've ridden. Like you can go pretty big without blowing the wheels out as long as you keep the spokes tight. I think it takes like a, I think it takes like an 80, eight, I think it takes like an 80 back wheel with a super mini front tire or 80 back tire with a super mini front tire, I think is like the, the combo. Yeah. So it looks like super mullet, but when you ride it, it just, it feels right. It's funny. That's sick. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, I'm gonna start looking into it because I, I just want to get some e bike wise and just have that different kind of experience, you know? Because that's like 2021. 20, I rode the most variation of of motorcycles that I have probably in my whole life. Like, because I I did the ambassador thing with Ducati, so I got lucky enough to ride a shit ton of different Ducatis. Um, and man, I was like, I was just so surprised. I think it's like moto dudes, especially like moto dudes at grot racing. It's like you got your practice bike and then you got your race bike and that's kind of it. And then you're on, you're on one, two fives this year. And then you're on two fifty Fs and then you're on four fifties and you just, you don't really ride all the bikes, um, that are kind of around, you know? And this year for me, like I rode one, two, five, two fifty. I bought a 96 CR 250. I rode the Ducati Multistrada, which is like the V4, like, 1100 or 1200 race bike motor in a fucking lounge chair basically thing has like electric <laughs> suspension adaptive cruise control like i looked at this thing they were telling me how like sick this bike was and they would like you gotta ride it you gotta ride it you gotta ride it i was like apprehensive i was like i don't know i don't see how i'm gonna enjoy this thing but then i rode it and i was like fuck <laughs> like this is the best bike ever then i rode like a supermoto then i rode a full race bike then i rode like a 1200 monster street bike so this the last year was the most bikes i'd ever rode in my life and i was like you know what there's a lot of value to just like having a, like a different horse for a different course yeah like you will never if you had two of the if you have two of these Kuberg bikes and you live by the beach somewhere like somewhere where your little local pub or restaurant is within, yeah. you know, 10 kilometers of your house, you can just take off, ride to the neighborhood, 
having a good time, laughing, talking to your buddies, you know, and then you'll see some jump somewhere and you're like, oh, you know, whip over here, go have some, like you'll, and then after a while, like you'll have a course laid out of the town yeah, yeah. There, where it's just fun, you know, like you have this, a whole new lease on, on life when you're going just on mundane, normal trips, like you will have so much fun. You just take it, pull it up to the, wherever you're going throw a little lock on it, go inside, have a good time, come on back. And then you're like, you look forward to the ride back because you're, it's just, you're motoing, but you're not offending anybody. Like, yeah, it, it's just a blast. Like you, you like, you just, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it's like you're doing something that you're not supposed yeah. to be doing. <laughs> yeah. But, but you're totally cool to do. But you're not. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like it it's like a grown up BMX bike. Yeah. You know, like when you're a kid and you're just ripping around town on a BMX bike and you're like you're just opening up like that whole world of you know, like your parents finally let you rip your bike wherever you want to go. Like it's like that, but on these little fun e bikes that I don't know. it's just a whole new experience. It's pretty yeah, you know, like I said, I, I take a lot of flack for it, but if you if you ever rode them, you'd you'd probably get it. Like you know, they're uh they're unique and yeah <laughs> uh, i'm getting i mean the best part is too, you don't even have to worry about parking you just rip straight up just put them right next to the door walk in like everybody's like laughing looking at you and then then you take off and just air like a 10 stare on the way out like just keep cruising <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun oh uh, i'm getting one uh, is it like a do you reckon it would be a good so like ricardo right he loves riding 110s that's like his shit and he's kind of scared to go onto a big bike for obvious reasons. Um, is it the kind of thing where it's like a good middle ground step between like being a pit bike guy and not riding a big bike? Because there is like a lot of people, I think when you grow up racing and shit, you kind of just take for granted like what you can do on a, on a dirt bike, you know? But if you like want to get into it, you know, maybe you can ride like a 110 and you've got that whole deal dialed, but it's like a totally different step to go from being a guy that like wants to ride, but is too scared to ride like a 250 or a 450. Uh, so you stick onto a 110, but that kind of like closes a lot of doors for you, you know, but I could see that you get on one of these things and then it kind of does become like a bit of an intermediary step to where you can like build up some confidence to go ride a moto. For sure, like uh, the thing, it, they go like fifty-five miles an hour. So I don't know whatever that is in kilometers. It's like probably nearly a like, hundred. Like nah, I think sixty. Sixty, 60 miles is a hundred, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it'd probably be going. So like it'd go 90. like they probably go like ninety. Yeah. Yeah. Ninety kilometers. So they're pretty quick, but they're only going to do that like on flat, like on a you know on a road, you know, or some yeah. real hard pack with not a lot of drag. But it's basically like you get that snap instantly. Like the thing will just wheelie instantly. Like the electric engines are super responsive. So it's like a snappy plusher 110, I guess is a good way to put it. And it's, you're not cramped like a 110. Like if yeah, feels you get into size, like the like, more you know, the position. Are yeah. High. yeah. Would I say it's like the best trick? I wouldn't say it's like, I, I mean, if you're worried about getting hurt coming from a pit bike to a big bike, you maybe you want to go like an XR 230 or something like that. But this thing is, they're just more fun. Like yeah. for, they're super snappy. They're light. They're way lighter. You can bunny hop them. You know, you just flick, you know, you, when you're done riding, you just come in, just plug it in. And that's all you do. You check the chain and the spokes. Like they're so easy and you can ride them. Like literally you just, just take them out. Like there's no rules with them. Yeah. Like, yeah. At least over in the States so far as I've seen, it's like, it's like a bird scooter. It's like a tricked out bird scooter. Yeah, <laughs> just ride it anywhere. So um, it, it is whatever you want to make of it. You can take it to the moto track and actually have fun on it. But would I suggest doing that? Like that's probably the, you'll have a blast. You'll hit half the jumps there if you really want to, but that's the least fun you'll have on that bike is on the moto track. Like that, they're yeah. fun everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So to go then to the stock. So I guess just talk about the experience of, like seeing it for the first time, riding it for the first time, like what are they like as a company? Um, you know, because there's, it's, dude, it's probably, the, that was probably like one of the most significant announcements in the history of motorcycling. I think it's, like it, it got a lot of attention, but I don't think, I don't think it's until, 
these things start coming out that people are going to realize how big that announcement was and and i was automatically in on it because the first thing you said to me when you called me was yeah we're not going to need gas for that much longer and i was like fuck if josh hill is that like i know like that was a private conversation too you know that wasn't like there's no incentive for you to to tell me that or there's no you know there's no cameras on like that was just you as a homie being like bro i'm telling you we will not need gas for too much longer yeah i mean that company that was a pretty professional launch they did it right like they hid this they hid this bike I don't know how they hit it so well. I mean, they, I guess they dude. just had the right people around them. Like they just had the right people around them. You know, they have professionals, you know, they had Eric Pernard helping them and, um, you know, they had Sebastian Tortelli, you know, they, they, they kept it tight in it and they did it right. And the bike looks beautiful. Like, and they had the thing together and they just did, they did a good job with it. And the company itself, it, it just seems futuristic a little bit. Like the way that they built this bike, they took every chassis from every company out there and stress test every spot on it and did all this, you know, 3D molding. And, you know, they, they really did their homework before they built this bike. It wasn't like, oh, we have this battery. We can build this around this frame. You know, we, mm. we can build a frame around this battery and this motor. And like, they tried to build that thing from the ground up, like, as a whole, I mean, the, the, the battery casing is integrated into the frame so that you can do a quick, easy swap, but you don't have, so if, does that like the casing is like the strong composite that's actually part of the frame. I think it's composite. Mm. I mean, it's just every little thing about it. Like they, they develop their own battery. Like they, it's just, it's remarkable. It's, you can tell that some money and some thought went into this bike. It wasn't, this didn't happen by accident. You don't ride something and it be that plush and that good. And just the ergonomics on it be just so good from the ground level. I mean, I, when I was going there, I'm thinking, okay, this is cool. I hope these chains don't just fly off on the jump face on me or something, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. cause we, nobody had really even ridden this bike much. You know, Sebastian Tortelli had probably, you know, he'd spent a, maybe a couple of days on it before I got on it. So pretty incredible what they're able to do and like i said i think it's just it's just scratching the surface it really is just scratching the surface on what these bikes are going to be capable of imagine once there's an actual competition in that realm Mm. you know they're basically just picking up where alta left off you know and and they've made it way better Uh, the alta was pretty remarkable and then this is going to be you know it's I think it's going to easily blow it out of the water. And, you know, I haven't done all the endurance testing on it. Like when we were doing it, like we did testing and then we were doing video. And to be honest, like we weren't really riding the bike at its full capacity either. And it was that really? good. So, cause it was so new, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty wild. Uh, I, I just can't wait till I have my own and I can go do all the things that, Cause I still drive around and all I do is have ideas. Like luckily for me, I got sponsors that like what I do and support me and support my vision of what I think is cool on motorcycles. So, and, and these electric bikes and, and being silent and, and you know, I, I have all kinds of ideas of things I want to do that hopefully don't, you know, that, that kind of just blur the lines of, of, you know, this is okay or not. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. So, uh, in terms of the, like the bike itself, um, is it kind of like you get on and you can compare it to like a modern 450 in terms of like the way that it turns, the way that, um, like the power is cause I mean, their whole model was like, they weren't just trying to build a, an, electric bike that was like a good electric bike. They were trying to build a bike that was better than the best current bike so if you like play it off against like the best current bike like how does it stack up in terms of you know just like all the general boxes that you use to compare bikes against each other so this is that's a good question and i think that 
you know how like when the two stroke, the, we had the two stroke only, and then the four stroke came out, and the four stroke, mm. everybody's like, oh, that you know, the four stroke's really good in the hard pack, or it's really good in the mud, or it's you know this or that. You kind of have those same things with the electric bike. It's its own, it's its own powertrain. It has its own complete, totally different feel than anything else. But it's so responsive. It's so easy to ride. And if you're like, if you were on, you know perfect traction and real hard, like, I guess maybe not perfect traction, real hard ground. That doesn't usually happen. But if you were on, you know, a, a ground that didn't have much drag to it, I assume that you'd hold a shot of 450 pretty much every time because you don't have to grab gears. It just yeah, hooks up, yeah, yeah. you know, like it, you don't realize how much downtime you have when you're like having to clutch and hit a gear like that yeah. totally disrupts your, you know, your, your forward momentum. And the way this thing just hooks up and pulls and just continues to pull, like I would assume on a on a real hard pack start, you'd probably whole shot a 450 on it. Now, when you take it to you know sand and, and deeper deeper stuff, it's just it's gonna eat a little bit of that power up because it doesn't have all that rotating inertia. It doesn't have this big flywheel, big clutch. It doesn't have all this stuff, you know, big piston crank, like all this stuff that's pushing the engine to continue going, even if it's under a load and under a bog, like, you know, mm. the, that everything in that engine still spinning. There's so much inertia and metal. Go, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where it's just yeah. a small engine that is all reliant off a of battery. So, you know, it does have like instant killer torque and the bike's super fast. But say if you mess up a rhythm section, and you know, overshoot a double and you try to slam a triple, it's all going off that battery. So mm -hmm. yeah, that battery and that smaller engine. So I haven't really got a chance to test it back to back. Like I bet you, okay, I, I did test at one track. We had a Honda 450, just a stock Honda 450 and the Stark. And I would have to say my lap times are probably really close. Yeah really close and we weren't riding the bike at the full potential of the bike's capabilities at that time because they were still wanting us to milk up to the levels if that makes yeah, sense yeah, because yeah. they knew what the bike was capable of they knew these top numbers but they wanted to take baby steps before we you know went to that extreme uh just to make sure there was no no issues but the cool thing was we had no significant issues like while we were there. I mean, it was, uh, it was pretty smooth sailing. So maybe they've uncovered, you know, I'm sure they've uncovered some things along the way since I've been there that needed fixed. And I know Sebastian Tortelli has got to be out there just, you know, grinding away at making that thing awesome. Uh, and I can't wait to when I, I, hopefully I get to go out there soon and go give it another shot and see what, see what they've improved on since. Are you going to go in Feb? When is that one? And I can't remember the date. February. Um, it was like at the end of Feb, I'm pretty sure. Like the 20th or t somewhere around there. I'm pretty sure. Um, Hopefully. Yeah, because I think I'm going to try and go out there for that one as well. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to. Any chance I get to go out there, I'd like to do it. It's, it's pretty cool. And like even just the company, like the... Ben and Anton, like those guys, yeah. you know, you can tell they've got big aspirations for what's going on. And yeah. they seem to have the business side of things kind of wired too. So I yeah. definitely want to stay close to those guys. I don't, I don't want them to forget about me. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I think once everybody ha once everybody sees what they're truly capable of, everybody's going to want a piece of that piece of that. Yeah. Deal. Yeah. That was one thing I was definitely impressed with, um, is the, like, once you put me in touch with those guys was just like the professionalism, the professionalism. Like when I spoke to Anton, like we had a video call, he's in a fucking suit. Like I've never seen that, uh, <laughs> you know? So it's like that, that it's not just like, I guess the product itself that they're working on that's out of the box. Like it seems like there's just an ethos, uh, as a company, on the whole that is different that they're trying to bring and i i just you'll never see me saying that like we shouldn't change like i'm all for people changing all the time like let's get as many different influences because it's like in my head that's what makes culture like the culture of our sport uh comes from like all the different influences and i think you know like our country i mean the u.s is the same it's like the reason why they're so fucking rad is that we've just got all of these different influences that get mixed in over time. Um, and I think that 
the the stock as a as a company it's like there's a cultural element to it as well and i think that they're gonna like add to our overall picture of like what we've got going on and i think that that's gonna force it's just gonna force other people to think differently uh and i think it's gonna force some like different reactions out of the those other bigger manufacturers as well it's i think it's just gonna turn the turn the screws on them to to make something new and exciting like that especially once you know eventually these bikes electric bikes are gonna outperform what we're currently at with four strokes it's just yeah. the the talk the, the the clock's ticking on it it's it's gonna happen i mean we're just the battery technology there's such a demand for it that you know they're gonna develop a battery for something that is totally not intended to be a dirt bike battery but somehow we're gonna end up using that cell mm. in a dirt bike you know like yeah. th- that's that's the thing and you know, maybe one day we'll have a, a universal, there'll be universal battery packs that, you know, you could, you'll be running, this dude's running Duracell, this guy's on uh, Panasonic, you know, <laughs> maybe yeah, that's going to yeah, be, yeah, right. yeah, this guy's yeah. Ryobi or DeWalt, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Maybe that's, that's where, where it comes in. And then, you're, you know, we have these chassis manufacturers, you know, that could be, who knows the, the direction it's going to go. But yeah, I, again, and I don't want to be that guy. I hope I don't go down as, I hope I just get looked at as like, you know, like the Lance Smale or like Doug Henry of electric bikes. You know, like <laughs> those guys are like the four stroke pioneers. Like I want, I mean, I'm not trying to kill gas bikes by any stretch. I, you know, I, I never want to see gas bikes go away, but I think there's a time and a place for all these things. And they're just, I can't even really control my, like, you know, my smile and my emotion thinking about all the fun that I've had on electric bikes Mm. and people will figure it out. All the flack that I've taken over the last six years, seven years, you know, I mean, I've had a lot of gay comments, dude, a lot of gay comments. (laughs) You're pretty far away from that too. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I think it's going to be cool. The, the thing is with you though like you're just the dude that fucking froths on riding two wheels like and like you've got the sponsors that let you like you you're probably the dude that rides the most bikes like sipes is in there berriman's fucking pretty pretty in there but like yeah you're i think in in the industry as it stands right now you're the dude that rides the most bikes and uh is in like the most disciplines so i think that it's pretty obvious to me that this isn't like some bandwagon thing that you're trying to get involved with like it seems like this is just a practical deal you're like hey like i have sponsors that pay me to do this shit and i get to ride all these bikes and i'm going in this direction purely because of the practicality like the application of it i'm not trying to create some kind of vibe here yeah i mean especially with the electric bikes like everybody thought i was dumb when i started getting into that but i was living uh in orange county and there's all these killer mountain bike places and there's all these killer places to go ride and ride around ride around the beach and all these i just see jumps everywhere i go when i'm riding around i'm still like a kid like you know a little kid like and the commercial with the, you know, with the motorcycle out the window jumping, like my mind still <laughs> unfortunately works like that. <laughs> and, but luckily for me, I've figured out how to, I guess, capitalize on that and have sponsors that, that like what I do. So that's why I got into electric bikes. I'd see all these things and just think, man, what if I could be going 60 miles an hour and hit this without anybody even hearing me? That's it. Yeah. That plain and simple. That's how I got into it. And then just seeing the, you know, how fun they are and the capabilities of it is what really is just, you know, that's, I'm convinced that it's going to be its own thing. Like it just keeps growing. It just, it's when, when we're having, you know, it just every, it just gives motorcycle riding a better rap. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. It, it just, when you, the guy that would have came and yelled at you for riding a motorcycle when you're on an electric bike stops and go wow that thing's pretty cool what is that you know just because you didn't wake him up and make his dog start barking and just because you didn't you know pierce his ears with that revving sound you could be going 60 through your neighborhood and nobody's gonna know nobody's gonna care yeah and that's that that's what it's for for me and if it translates into being a better bike to race 
so be it. You know, if that's if that's the direction that it takes, you know, my hand, like. I don't know if, how I'll feel about Supercross. You know, I, it's going to be weird if there's ever a stadium full of people and no no dirt bike noises. Like, that's going to be really weird. But, you know, what what do you do then? Do you just mic everybody up so you can hear the, the shit talking? Like, yeah. Maybe that's, that's the substitute? I don't know. I don't know if I really want to see that. But I think that it's it's one day you'll just be going faster on them. And yeah. that, it, it'll just go its own direction. And so, uh, in terms of the, with the Stark, uh, in terms of just like the, the package of like the brakes and the suspension, and I guess the, the more like tangible parts of, of riding it, is it pretty much just like right there in line with every other, every other bike? Like, cause I think that was the thing with the, the Alter is like, ah, oh, I kind of had like the suspension wasn't that good. And it's like, you know the the overall package itself wasn't in line with like a ktm 450 kind of deal yeah the last year they came out with the alta it was it had i think it had that Trax shock and i think it had the air forks like the 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 cone or i don't know whatever it was better like it was pretty much on par like on par maybe it was like two years behind where yeah. the stark is everything's top of the line so it's you know it's kyb you'll be able to send it no matter where you are you're going to know somebody that knows how to work on this fork and shock and you'll be able to dial that in i think the brakes i don't remember what they are but they work good. you know it's it's there's some it, it's kind of universal parts around yeah. you know like you're a little bit more universal where the alta had things that were a little bit specific like i yeah. think that that makes sense but as far as like the like the yeah <laughs> The suspension is good. The bike is unbelievable. Like as far as the the handling, you're gonna trip when you actually ride it. You'll never find a bike that's so easy to tip in. I just yep. see a picture that they posted the other like yesterday. You see that picture of Sebastian like damn near dragging his handlebars like with Where was both on? feet on the pegs. I think Where? it was on Stark's page not too long ago. But well, the let me have a look. the thing is super skinny. It's I think they said it's like 242 pounds. So that's less than, that's less than like a Kawasaki or Yamaha 450, I believe, like weight yeah, wise. Right. But then it it feels like it, it doesn't. It feels kind of weightless because you don't you don't have all that. You know, like what I was like I was talking about. You have the the benefit of the all that rotating mass. Yeah. Um, you know, to pull yourself out of situations that also fights against you when you're trying to tip it into a turn. It wants to go yeah. straight. Yep. all that stuff's moving like it wants to pull up and it wants to go straight that thing just you tilt your head and dip in and just turns it's so effortless and it, yeah it, you'll be blown away when you ride it it just imagine to riding a bike like where everything's so tight and there's zero vibration you yeah. know what i mean like it's more it's more factory than factory because you, know, you get on a good factory bike everything's super tight you don't hear any like weird noises like everything's just they've spent an extra 15 grand building this bike to make sure like it, it gets rid of that five percent of drag you know what i mean yeah. yeah it's that it's that even more it's yeah the, i mean and if you're not sold yet the logo's like 24 karat gold or something <laughs> actual gold like, in, like built into the plastic and uh yeah it's, it's pretty cool like i guess you know their their contribution to like the you know trying to the, i guess be better for the environment as they were i think they said that they use about a third or a quarter of the plastic the actual plastic to to form their uh, you know, their kits. Yeah. Like they've just figured out a way, like the way that they've designed it and, and the, the shapes that it uses way less plastic. And they, you know, say that that's a big pollutant, but you know, yeah, just throwing little kickers in there. They're pretty cool. I noticed, uh, I've been riding my one, two, five, like flat out. Cause I'm about to give it away. So I've been trying to get in some laps on it because it's by far the best bike I've ever owned in my entire life. Uh, but so I pretty much spent like all of my like Christmas holidays and shit, just doing a million laps on this one, two, five. And then I went back to riding a three fifty, well, my 350. And I fucking love that bike. And after doing so many laps on a one, two, five, I was like, this is a piece of shit. <laughs> like this thing, it's fucking heavy like the i was riding one track that's just got a lot of like deep ruts coming into the turn but with like braking bumps in the rut 
and I was just like, this fucking engine brake is just like a nightmare right now. Like it's making my bike handle like shit. And then, you know, like the, the way that you sort of chop off the throttle and if you're not holding the clutch in while you're coming into the turn, you've just got all like, I've never, I guess what I'm trying to say is I've never really felt the weight and the inertia in the way that you described it because for so long I haven't really ridden anything else. And then now getting on uh you know to spend so much time on a 125 and just to not have that rotating mass and to not have the drag from the the engine braking like this is the first time where i've ever really noticed like how significant it is on a modern four stroke yeah on 125s you gotta like i mean it's just i feel like if uh, for me riding a 450 all the time if i jump on a 125 i'm a fish out of water i forgot that i have to like be so precise Use on my shifts where I have to carry <laughs> speed. I can't just like barrel it into something and then have a pivot point. Like you have to start your brakes, start your roll on. I mean, there's like a whole nother set of skills that come with it. And to be honest, that, that e-bike, it's going to be the opposite. <laughs> it's going to make everybody <laughs> ride better, easier, um, which, you know, it's going to take, I, it, I would be, willing to bet just about any old timer, you know, vet rider, novice. Yeah. Unless you're at that pro intermediate level, you know, then it, the, the, the benefits, you know, shrink a little bit because those guys are able to ride these bikes to their actual capability. Yeah. But this thing, like you can tune it exactly to your comfort level. Like if you don't like engine braking, take it off. If yeah. you like the engine braking, say it's a hard pack track and you want something to drag you down and keep your bike kind of locked to the dirt, turn it up. But if it's real bumpy and you know, you're finding the bottoms of the holes when you let off because of that engine braking, turn it off. <laughs> like yeah. it's that simple where before like you'd have to, you know, this is, this is the catch 22 because before you would have to go and you'd have to send that bike to, you know, one of these companies to adjust your engine and, and it'd be like you have these mad scientists that figured out how to yeah. exactly like these guys have dedicated their whole lives to making an internal combustion engine do those things that you're asking for and now you're going to be able to do it with the turn of a knob which is scary but also exciting you know i'm sure yeah. everybody's gonna you know it's gonna evolve but yeah it's kind of just crazy the way it works it's gonna it's just u- user friendly yeah, I'm. Uh, I pretty much guarantee that uh, in February. Like, I'm sure that. I mean, I. I hope. I'm pretty sure they said that they're gonna have all of the 450s there, like all of the current 450s there. I will guarantee right now that I would be like sec. I've never even ridden this thing, but like from riding other like electronic shit, and even like in the in the road bike stuff, like the way that. Um, like on my Ducatis, like I can change like the wheelie amount, like the wheelie angle. So like once it gets to like a certain angle, like the electronics kick in, it just keeps it there. So like the, my Ducati, you can just hold the thing fucking wide open out of a turn and the front wheel will come up like a couple inches. And then you just hold the thing on the stop and it just holds that wheelie. It's fucking crazy, dude. And then like my engine braking, dude it's so gnarly so you know i've got like it's a 200 plus um oh no not quite 200 probably like a 100 140 150 horsepower bike and you just get come out of a turn and just fucking hold the thing on the stop and then with the engine braking if you're like start if you're like can't get the bike stepped out as you're coming into a turn then you can just add more engine braking and then you start banging through the gears and the thing will step out if you don't want that you can take it off like i've done laps with no traction control at all and then i've done laps where you just crack the again you crack the throttle wide open and that thing is not going to step out so in terms of just like general safety and you know like usability i guarantee that when i go and ride that bike (laughs) I will be faster than I could go on any of those modern 450s. And I mean, it, it, I guess it'd be hard to take like the bias out of it, um, you know, because I guess you maybe there's some confirmation bias that I already think I'll be faster on a 450, but I feel pretty confident in saying <coughs> that if I go over there, I will definitely be fast because I'm just at that level where I think all of those things will make a difference to me. 
Well, just I mean, when when you twist the throttle, it's it's there. It doesn't matter how much momentum you're carrying. You're always in the meat of the power band, like mm. from a stop to thirty miles an hour. That's pretty remarkable. Like <laughs> you you can't really put a foot wrong. That's the mm. the wild thing about it, you know. And then how good they got the ergonomics is. Like I said, it's just, it's something to behold. Mm. It's going to be cool to, I can't wait. To, I just can't wait till more people ride it to, to, to see I'm not crazy. You know? Yeah. It's pretty sweet. Like, yeah. And then when I have one in my, in my possession, I, I got some good ideas for it. Like I got, I need to get it quick because my boy Scranny is going hard in the streets right now. He's taking, he's pulling off everything. So he'll have, he has, he's going to have some videos coming out soon too. You were you were right when you, I think it was like the first podcast you you talked about Scranny and you were like this is like the guy and uh, that that was uh, yeah you were right about that he's a fucking animal. <laughs> Wait till you see what he's up to like right now it's so wild. Well, I mean I've this- got I've got some cool stuff coming out like here in the next couple of weeks but like Scranny's got like a whole like like real street riding encounters pulling off stuff that is like people are going to lose their minds when they see it he's you know he's pulling off hollywood stunts <laughs> like with like three buddies in a pickup truck <laughs> like Dude. it's uh i can't wait for it to see light of day i'm like i'm proud of him can't wait he uh it, it, that's the other thing too i guess like this whole uh, e-bike kind of revolution that's going to come is like it's going to just change free riding i mean you got justin mumford's like kind of doing his own unique deal as it is but that that comes with like this whole element of like getting shut down by the cops at every at every turn and you know you look at a dude like scranny like he ain't ever making a 450 main event on a, on a supercross track and that's like not his lane but it's like there, here's a guy that's going to be able to make a a name for himself and like have carved this like whole lane and make this whole genre for himself to where like he could probably like he's probably going to end up being like a fairly famous dude in moto like off this whole off the back of this whole revolution you know yeah i mean mulford like kind of opened up everybody's eyes like that he got a company behind a street moto video Mm. you know like I put out some, you know, street, you know, some little street stuff on my e-bike and skate parks and, you know, Scranny put out his own little video part with him and his buddy, you know, jumping out of parking garages and like just you know, riding the Bakersfield sign, like wall riding it and jumping over golf courses, <laughs> just like all the funny stuff he did. And then Mulford took it like another step forward and got, you know, he had the backing of all those, you know, pro skaters. He kind of really went to... I, I had the vibe of like, he was just kind of tagging along with like the top pro skaters and then putting his wheels on them and putting his own little mark on what they were doing, which that was a real unique way of going about it. That that's going to be different than, you know, he's going to have a different take from, uh, you know, Mulford's gonna have a different take on, on r- street riding and, and what he's doing than, than most of us, you know, cause he just rolls, he rolls pretty tough with that crew of, you know, like top elite skaters, like, you know, Loy and Nyjah and everybody like that. So it's uh it's cool but like Scranny I feel like is like a low budget Hollywood stunt man. Like he's pulling off like stunts. Like legit stunts. <laughs> like, like I mean not saying that these other guys aren't, but when you see some of the stuff like I, I just can't wait. I, I can't spill the beans on it, but it's going to be great. Like I've been working all summer on a project and I'm more excited about his project than my own that's coming out here soon. You know, like he, it's going to be cool. And like Raha has got a project coming. It's yeah. just, it's cool to see that everybody, when I quit racing dirt bikes and I worked at monster, the thing that I tried to do was I would say, I, I went into the, you know, monster. And I was like, we need to get, you know, more guys that are specific, specific to making, you know, like doing these cool things. Like, Mm. you know, Axel, when Axel was just coming out, he was, you know, he was a good amateur rider, but just kind of didn't have the last year pro that he, or last year amateur pro, but we're like, you know, he was a killer fit for monster. And he was like, 
he was that guy that could do the crazy stuff that people didn't want to do and that people like monster could get behind and market. And it's Mm. just cool to see like, you know, a lot of these companies are getting their own guy like that, you know, like that are doing these projects. Everybody's getting a film budget now, you know, like motocrossers didn't get film budgets. Like when I quit racing and went into moto, I went into like, try to get people film budgets and now people are getting film budgets. Like not to like say like, I'm, you know, it was a, a collective, you know, thing yeah. with everybody in the. In but it was the, like an active sport, push that you wanted to make. Yeah, and I think that it's it's working. Like people are, you know, like Beerman has his own event. Like I'm doing my like big hill jam. Axel's Axel's got his thing. Like you know, Raha's doing his movie. Like you know, just there's every these rider own and ran contests projects are Mm. becoming the norm and that's what i'm excited about like i'm i'm you know more excited to go to my you know like like to have my event and go to beerman's imagination and do like all that kind of stuff like that is x games is is still around and still hanging but i'm more excited for to see what everybody's doing to you know push push these new ideas with without the the con the constraints of you know having a corporate sponsorship into it it's kind of like we're just getting thrown the keys like hey go try it see what happens so i'm excited for it i think there's going to be even more you know uh, i hope to see some it'll be cool to see uh sounds like there might be some welding of mountain bike and moto together soon too yeah so that'll be i think that i think they go too hand in hand not to yeah, well, you, you look at like sweet. the you look at like the fest series. Like when when you were talking about that Kuberg, it's just like, dude, you could probably take that and hit those fest series jumps and be in the same kind of conversation as like a dude like Remy Morton. You know, like you got and Cam Zinc and like the dudes that are like really pushing in in that whole world as well. Um, so yeah, and I think that. We, we sort of like, there was a free ride 1.0 and I feel like that was Twitch and, you know, the going to the hills and that whole s- s- kind of deal. But like the industry that they were in was funded by freestyle competitions. So you were kind of like completely dictated, uh, like the whole free ride movement was sort of had to work around the X Games, X Fighters kind of deal. And then that's sort of gone away now. Um, to where you're right like this generation is i feel like the first generation of like legit free riders in the sense that there's like skaters and free surfers that just make a career off like never even having to do an event and if it is an event that they do it's like an event that's put on by their peers yeah exactly and that's i mean it's it's cool to see because I think in the last few years, when you start having, you know, big companies are running these action sports events, I I don't, I I don't envy being in their shoes on balancing budgets and deciding who gets what attention and what money. And especially like when you're at Viking stadium in Minneapolis and you have to just like portion out the, the size of the field for what events get, what, you know, what size of the floor. Mm. like that you kind of you kind of it's cool to have it all in one event but you start to kind of dumb down everything a little bit so it's cool like with these you know you, even they were doing like those fight club things like they did it at mcneil's house like that was pretty cool you know mm. and the, the imagination thing was like was full blown like that course there's never been a course like that and uh it was almost kind of, I always felt like it was cool to, it was really cool to be there and there was some gnarly stuff, but I almost was like sitting there thinking, man, they should have invited some like real freestyle guys. Like I bet you they would have started to go off out here. Mm. And I think that maybe they're trying to keep that from happening because that's just going to be the, I mean, it's scary enough throwing a whip over those jumps. Imagine when those guys start trying to throw flip tricks over those jumps. No, oh. you know, like I've seen Taka, I've seen Taka ride in the hills. Like Taka, Taka, I've seen him hit random dirt hits and throw like massive flip tricks like double grab flips off dirt hits in the hills yeah you ain't fucking with that no, like no i mean and <laughs> I, I don't know it's just it, it's almost like he's so gnarly that he's doing these tricks on free ride you can't even call it free ride anymore it's like 
the, you know, he like doesn't even get the respect for that. <laughs> so I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting to, to see where that transforms into. Cause you could tell Ari was already brewing with, with Colby and, and Axel. Like they were kind of, they start flipping everything. They start tricking everything. And it became, it was almost like freestyle start sparking back up. But then again, if you would have had Jeremy and his Jeremy Stenberg in his prime and uh, Todd Potter in his prime and Wes Ag in his prime, like on those courses, like they would have maybe they would have won that contest too. You know, it's mm. just kind of happened to start back over. But either way, it's just cool to see that everybody's out there trying to make their dreams come true. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and putting stuff on for more than anything, just their buddies in the culture, you know, like we're yeah. not really making a bunch of money off this stuff. We're just probably taking way more of a risk than we ever should to yeah. promote these events and do these things. You know, like, like when I did my, when I did my event, like I put my nuts on the line and put like 50, like 50, 60 grand of my own money up just on the dream that, Hey, like, I think this thing, I think people are going to show up, you know? And if not, it's <laughs> We're going to get some good content either way. So I guess that's all we're going to do. And, Hell, um, uh, Oh, how how was the Big Hill Jam this year? Like, was it a success? It, it looked fucking epic. It, it was it was a huge success for what it was supposed to be. Like, I wanted to put on a killer local event, and that's what yeah. I did. Like, yeah. we sold we sold out. Like, I wasn't trying to I wasn't trying to 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 do something wild and have te- you know tens of thousands of people there. I we sold out and you know, we were having to turn people away cause with what we were at, you know, I think it, it was just, we made it into what it was. It was great. And hopefully this year we'll be able to build on it a little bit, but I just want it to always try to keep it that little bit of a tight knit event because you mm. get that many people that are that passionate and wild about the things that we're doing. It's going to get, it's going to get out of hand quick. So we got to keep it, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's gnarly. Like my property itself is gnarly. It's one of the gnarliest properties anywhere um and but it's just i feel like the events that we did were awesome because hill climb pretty much anybody can be involved in hill climb yeah is it's such a self-explanatory sport i got him to change the rules so the 450 class like anybody can sign up like if you have a 450 and you think you can make it up this hill fast sign up ready to go go. you know what i mean that have a go and, and then you you start out with like a hundred people and then we qualify down on you know on Saturday down to thirty two and then you know we do that's when you go do the head to head on the four fifties. So it's kinda like it's it, it's everybody can come in and do that. We had te, uh you know five five thousand dollar purse for the pit bike race. So that, you know, it, it was like we had people's involvement that, you know, weren't maybe pros, but they were racing with pros. And they could be competitive in these things, you know, like the, a hill climb. If you know how to hold the bike op- wide open and do a start and you've got some skill, you're in the mix to, to win this thing. And it's just fun, man. And then to top it off, the, the cherry on, on top was how many of my buddies showed up from the freestyle free ride side that just put on an absolute amazing show on just my play jumps around the property i mean that like the the hill climb and all that alone like the crowd was going nuts because a lot of people hadn't seen it before and it's it's wild like you purposely make jumps that are right on the verge of your bike can make it or can't impossible yeah of being possible but you're going uphill so if you crash like yeah it might slam you might you know twist an ankle or something but it's not as high risk as you know it's still gnarly but it's not it's not as doer. It's not life as life and death is, is sometimes yeah. motocross racing can be. So you can take more chances and have more fun at it. And it's just all around a great vibe. We had a couple bands and just good time. That's so sick. So that's something that come out like, one of these times, dude, I'm fucking there. <laughs> I need to, uh, I need to figure out the, the situation to get, to get back there, but I'd love to come over. Cause that, that's just looks like a super fun dirt bike event like the kind of thing that like you just should go to if you love bikes it's just grassroots really i mean just it had the most local vibe ever um like you know my mom and uh molly and just my brother's my brother's wife like they were running the gates you know then me and my dad are running around and nick desiderio and like just uh you know a couple bunch of you know guys from our local town were you know, the local motocross 
crowd from our town came really came through to to help out the guys from JBP. Like it was just a fun it was a super fun grassroots event that blew up as good. It blew up to the perfect size. Like we could yeah. just handle what we got. It it couldn't have been any better. And uh I think everybody that showed up really for the most part really had a good time. And you know, like for this year we built out more even more parking and just like, uh, you know, we've seeded the whole place grass. So this year we're going to hold it a little bit earlier in the year and, you know, still be all nice and green out in Oregon where this year we was kind of, I was just cutting dirt roads and parking lots for everybody to get around on. So it was a little bit brown and ugly, but this year it'll have more of a, a, a beautiful look to the facility. It'll be pretty cool. Let's see. Just and keep at, trying to make the hill gnarlier too. So you, did you make, yeah. like you made your money back? Like you kind of covered everything sweet to where it wasn't like, cook in your pockets no we i mean it by the skin of our teeth we made it you know what i mean we made it back but we you know we had you know it, it just enough to where we could you know i guess i could give some money to my parents for the hassle and you know like i guess co- covered my butt a little bit but i mean there was there was a time when i was i was i was sweating it for sure because i think we i dumped like 50 grand into it to get it going you know just renting equipment and diesel and you know just there's so many things that go into it just it just kept adding up you know we we're putting yeah. pur- some purses and it was just it was wild but then we had so many cool sponsors yeah, it was just fun like it, it was just it was like uh it was just like a, a good time it was like a party of with full of just moto people that were there to have a good time and i i think we just got lucky because it was the first year but everybody was super respectful for the most part too. You know, like even after the event, like people started cleaning the trash up, like on their own, like bagging it up and helping out and put pitching in. And, you know, anytime things would escalate to, you know, a certain level, you know, people, somebody would, you know, people would step in and and cooler heads would prevail. And that's hard to do with that many, you know, gnarly people. Cause let's just put it like, that free ride crew is gnarly. That freestyle crew is gnarly. The hill climb crew is gnarly. Like, yeah. And then, you know, you've seen how wild the pit bike, the pit bike scene right now is wild. It's, it's a, a combination of all these awesome things. And we just held it in one, one spot. And I mean, I think we can just keep growing it and keep coming up with more fun ideas to, to, to put on a cool, you know, more of a, like a festival weekend, a dirt bike festival than anything. And then, Luckily, like we got, you know, the backing of like the, you know, Moto Climb Super Series, which is, you know, it's round, I think this year's gonna be round three of that series again. And I mean, it's just pretty cool. Pretty cool what we're able to come up with. Hopefully I'll just be able to keep sweetening up the pot. We had $20,000 in purse purse money last year. Hopefully we'll just keep, keep bumping it up and finding sponsors and make it something, make it something worthwhile, you know? Hopefully that'll be my, my legacy. I can give something back cool to the, to the people of, you know Douglas County. Yeah, you know, we had we had this uh, like we we got involved with these guys. Uh, they're called Ultra Umpqua Land Trail Riders Association, and they were kind of helping us with the event organization. And they're trying to put together like a big trail system for dirt bikes in the county, and it's just it just brought a lot of good people together. It was it was fun. So I hope we can just continue to keep doing it, and everybody can have a good time, but be respectful so we can keep it going. Because I can tell you, like. It's like that girl is freaking out in the stands at Anaheim. Like, girls start, you know, pulling them out. My mom's going to shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Uh, you know, uh, my my little event idea, you need to dig out a trench and have a hydroplane competition. Good idea. I think that Very that could idea. really work. Yeah. And same as idea. the hill climb, like just, just barely makeable. Yeah, I think so. I think we got to start like adding almost like enduro cross like uh, type obstacles, at least into the 450 hill. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just start, just make the 450 hill gnarly. That way we can kind of separate, separate guys, you know, and, and, and like, you know, start out. Maybe it's like a, you start with like a, a three quarter super cross section, you know, like something yeah. that like that you could still do with an extended and then go into like, you know, have a couple like, I don't know, it'd just be cool just to keep trick it out a hill climb it's like straight rhythm but it's like backyard yeah. straight rhythm yeah. yeah yeah vertical straight rhythm 
Yeah, it's it's fun, man. You get you get just as pumped up to do that as anything, especially when you get on those big like three hundred horsepower nitrous burly bikes. Like dude, those things don't have rear brakes. Yeah, it seems them. like a lot. Like, oh, it's so fun though. There's nothing like it. Like there's there's nothing like getting on one of those things. That's it's stupid. That's sick. Hey, uh, <laughs> so before you go, uh, are you busy in June? June when? <sighs> First June June twenty fifth and twenty sixth is I think when we're gonna have our oh the wedding video. yeah oh the well no I'm getting married in July okay the big hill jam I think that's 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 what we're planning on right now the twenty fifth and twenty sixth I think uh you what's going on Mangy and Fink oh Mangy maybe Fink I'm scared of. I'm definitely scared of Fink. That names that names Fink. The name just sounds like oh yeah, the Fink. It sounds like something <laughs> out of Mad Max. Bro, it seems it like is, a scene out of Mad Max. It is a scene out of Mad Max. It's fucking wild. Yeah, so we're gonna do. We're gonna drive. Me and Sammy are gonna do. Uh, we're gonna drive to Manji again, and then this year I want to get like basically a bunch of people last year said that. Um, said that they wanted to like do that drive with us um and like race it so i'm gonna basically like we'll have some convoy meetup points and then we'll try and get like a gypsy gang convoy driving over there um and then so fink is the weekend after so we'll basically we're gonna have like two trucks so we'll have like our van drive to manji and then we'll have another truck drive out to fink and then we'll fl- we'll drive to fink do the race and then on the monday morning with a real sore head we'll fly to alice springs and then our desert bikes will be there and then we'll like start pre-running for a couple of days to try and get the course semi dialed in and then just basically try and survive so it'll be three weeks well i guess it'd be like two full weeks of just like epic dirt bike shit but i'm fucking scared like i can't front on that at all i'm definitely scared to do it and i mean it's gnarly like i was pretty beat up after manji i had like a fairly sizable crash in the first moto i just uh i started running earplugs when i ride and uh and then i just had like a yz 250 up my inside that i just did not i just couldn't hear the dude and uh and i pretty much just like cross jumped straight into him took my own front wheel out and uh it was like a fourth gear fucking yard sale um so yeah it's gonna be like hard to just get out of manji in like good enough condition to then go and do the hardest race in australia essentially yeah i think you're gonna be digging sand out of your crack for a long time after that (laughs) (laughs) that's gonna be a heavy week like you probably won't want to look at a dirt bike for a long time after that i did manji once manji was sick but manji's gnarly like at least on the pro side you ride so much Mm -hmm. the motos weren't super long but like i feel like we did like six motos Mm -hmm. between like because you kind of have like a a couple standard motos and then you have like don't they have like a back 15 or whatever like elimination they have like an elimination moto like if they start out with like 40 or whatever and then like they take 20 and then they take like 10 and then they had like those like two lap sprint motos or is that the same thing? I don't know. Yeah. No, yeah. That's the, yeah, yeah it was the same race. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, dude, it is, it's gnarly. And then the Fink, like, I don't know. I'm scared of that stuff. Like, those guys are too fast. They're too ballsy. Like, I ain't trying to go as fast as I can go on a dirt bike, not knowing what's in front of me. If there's like a kangaroo or, you know, just any, you know, even over here, a deer or a coyote or just something like, dude, that's just it's life and death like you gotta like, and you don't know what's around the corner it could be you know like i've always been afraid to do i've you know people always try to talk me into doing baja but baja's gnarly like yeah there's dudes that just live out there they're bored and they dig booby traps just to see dudes like handle it or not like <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so heavy like i don't know that type of racing is not for me i'm a closed course kind of kind of guy i mean i love free riding <laughs> But when I'm out scouting as if like anybody can keep up with me when I'm scouting for free riding, like Molly can hop on an electric bike and keep up with me when I'm scouting for free riding for the most part. Yeah. Like, I don't go fast unless I know where I'm going. So I yeah, well, good luck I'm kind of right there with Be you, safe. man. Yeah. The thing that's uh, like the closest thing that I would have done is we rode to like the very tip of Australia. So we did like a two week, uh, it was just a big camping trip 
Um, that's like when I talk about my first ever memories, like that's some of my first ever memories was like my dad would do that ride and then we were literally just toddlers, like still in nappies and shit uh, or like diapers. And that's like all the photos that we've got is like us doing that trip. And uh, there was like one section in particular where we rode it. Uh, it must have been like the first day or the second day. And I was on a KTM 450, like motocross bike, standard gearing, everything. I was just fucking broken, disorganized. So I'd like, that had the shittest bike. <laughs> and, uh, and the first day we rode through this section and I was doing like 80 kilometers an hour. So I don't know what that would be. Probably like 55 or f- no, 45. Fast enough. Four, yeah. So, and I was like scared and I'm like kind of cruising through and, and it felt really, really fast to me to be doing that. And then three, four or five, six days later, when we're riding that exact same piece of trail on the way back, I was doing 140 on the like kilometers an hour. So, I mean, that's 70, (laughs) 75 mile an hour and it was fun. And I was like, that's where... And I was uh, the guy that was riding next to me because you kind of ride in pairs and then you've got like another pair in front of you because of the dust. And uh, so you space it out, but you ride side by side. And so he's on this big KTM 500 and he's a good rider. And I, I didn't want to be the dude that was like keeping him up, you know? So I was like, oh, I'll just keep up. But we were both just pushing each other so fucking hard. And then we we probably did like 40 minutes where we were just fucking wide open and like this KTM 450 was just like valve bouncing in fifth gear and then we we pull over at this like uh this gate like you have to open up these gates to go through these big uh cattle stations and uh that's just like I mean we could settle down for this next bit and I was like dude 100 percent like we were moving and he's like we were doing 140 <laughs> kilometers an hour for about 40 minutes he's like and he said what you say he's like man kangaroos foxes like we definitely got to slow down and i i was like fucking not trying to be a hero but you just get used to going you know when you're on a trip like that and you're riding all day every day like we're in the saddle for fucking eight hours a day that speed thing just sort of slowly starts to go away and you just end up going so fucking fast yeah it's almost like Glenn Helen at the end of the day, just the track gets worse, but you just get used to just like, just like, ah, ah, ah. like you know what I mean? Just get numb to like, go. Like you, you shouldn't be going faster, but somehow your lap times get better. Just so you're <laughs> yeah. just used to that, like being uncomfortable, wide open. You're like, you're like shaking, like you know what I mean? Like you, yeah, your you've been eyeballs sitting in the vibrate. for so long. You're like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's probably the closest thing that I could uh, compare compare that feeling to. I mean, I've gone on some rides, but that's not me dude i'm not i'm not high speed guy even like the only time i get like to go fifth gear pin is if i know i got like a perfect runway to a perfect jump and then you know what i mean I, that's that's fun to me but <clears throat> yeah i don't know need a good landing <laughs> <laughs> the, just uh, wide open through the trees dude can't do it yeah the, i uh i did a i did a um track day on like a 675 race bike uh like road bike fuck man i was I was legitimately scared before I went to that day. Like it was a friend's bike that I was riding and he invited me out and I already had like, I got all my leathers and shit now because of the Ducati thing. And, um, man, I, I'm not this guy at all. I'm like totally on that level, but I found myself like you get the data that comes off the bikes. It tells you like your top speed and shit. I was just by the, like, by the third session out there, I was, there's like a, like a S section before the front straightaway. And like by the end of it, dude, I was just like waiting every lap to just fucking send it as hard as I could out of the chicane and just like tuck in and just bang gears like the whole way. I was trying to, cause I think it was like 200 and I think it was like 206 kilometers an hour was like as fast as I could get this thing. Um, but like I even run off at one of the, <laughs> I even run off into the gravel on turn one cause I was just like trying to get this top speed going. But yeah, I don't know, like for someone that's not really that guy, I definitely found it really, really fun to spend a whole day just fucking sending it. But I don't know if that's probably, it's probably not the smartest thing to do long term. That sounds like a good time. I'd be down to try it on a closed track. I've just never had that opportunity to like ride a street bike on a closed track. But I'm like, I got no want to go ripping around fast on a street bike. Like on the yeah, road. Nah, got nah. zero, zero want. I mean, Dude, like I'm either gonna get arrested or I'm gonna get hurt. 
Like I'm just yeah. zero zero into it. <laughs> you would absolutely love riding a street like a race bike on a track. It was I left that that day completely mind blown. Like wanted to just go and drop fucking twenty seven thousand dollars on a bike straight away it was that fun dude i'm like think i was leaving the track like i need to get a bike and then i'm gonna have to get a van i'm gonna have to get tire warm like <laughs> it's a lot but fuck the feeling was insane dude i had so much fun i bet i didn't uh, the closest thing i've ever done to that is we did uh we were doing some supermoto i was i went and tested supermoto for a couple of days we were thinking about going was that back in the x games why days why i didn't <clears throat> no no it was like way after that um, oh really just the guy actually the same guy that got me into snow biking um was ran the um the supermoto series so we went testing and doing some stuff and it was just like the dates didn't work out i forget what what even happened but it was really fun like supermoto mm. is is pretty fun like like it's just a totally different feeling the way you yeah, tip the bike huh? and all that kind of stuff like and then how weird the bike reacts on dirt with knob without knobbies is so yeah. like you don't realize how good knobbies are even if it's like hard pack slick that you like you wouldn't even think your knobbies would do anything somehow they are mm. yeah it's I, wild. well if anyone's listening to this podcast that rides uh road bikes and you live in north carolina um and you want josh hill to fucking send your bike around the course then hit me up i'll put you in contact because i would uh i would be keen to see you do that yeah i'd love to do it. it'd be fun to check it out well uh i'll take if you want to come do manji i'll figure out a way to get you a bike and to come and do that race with us and just fly over and uh we'll take your shit fly in fly out then go thanks probably too much but um, if you want to come do Manji, then I'll be fucking pumped. You don't have to do the drive either. either. Well, you t- could like fly in. Manji would be fun. I'll have to see where I'm at at that at that point. Like what I got going on. If I'm just full work workhorse down at the farm, getting ready for the event, or if I'm that's, you know, that's able to get thing. some motos in. Yeah, because like if I have like I don't want to show up to Manji like not prepared. That place will. It's not smooth. It's gnarly. No. Like you. It's high intensity, rough sand. It's a gnarly race, but it's it's a really cool race. That, I wish somebody would kind of capture that race better. Like, well, that's what my like plan the, is the this event year as a whole. Yeah, yeah, we we yeah, were like, be, yeah, we were pretty under gun. Like, we just took Rones last year, and it was just like him and one camera. But this year, like, that's kind of like my goal with it is to really show people like how fucking gnarly that event is like we pretty much like just did a vlog from it last year but this year we're gonna do like something legit yeah. you know and i think it's just cool the fact that we're gonna have to like we're gonna have to charter a plane to fly you know like the the next the monday after the fucking after party to fly into alice springs and then the desert bike's gonna be there like i think it's gonna be like i want to make a, like a doco type deal like a feature film about like the whole driving to manji and then doing that race and then flying to alice and then doing that race and then taking our sorry asses home at the end of it and yeah i'm probably not going to want to ride for a while after that yeah that drive home is going to be gnarly too <clears throat> i don't know that I'm doing what's that. uh dude, dude give, give us a little like let, let me see that shirt it looks like a nascar shirt dude, that is that's, sweet. Uh, jackson richardson go the rat baby oh yeah you can buy it. you can no, buy these at go the rat racing.com you want one of these uh i don't know dude i tried to ship some stuff to australia it was so expensive i'm not gonna do that to you no we got you bro sammy or sammy no, will be sweet on that. i love i love that it's like this full nascar style yeah let's go the rat baby i'm pretty sure i thought that photo was from manji that that, that photo might actually be from manji i'm not not kidding well, that's sweet. That looks like a t-shirt I had when I was like four. I think it's well, red. We'll get Sammy to send one. Well, hey, uh, <laughs> fucking done over three hours, brother. I um, appreciate it. I know you weren't feeling the best, but um, this is a fucking dope podcast. I feel like any time you get on here, it's, uh, it's a fucking good time. I was going to talk some shit on Mathis, but we run out of time. It's all good. We don't need to do that. Take the high road. <laughs> He's a good guy. He's doing his thing. You do your thing. Uh, we do our uh, thing. Uh, that's More power to him, right? Nah, that's it. It takes all types. Uh, of it. it takes all types to make the world go around, eh? 
hey, and it's the guys that like him might not like us as much. It's all good. Hey, yeah, I feel, I feel it. Um, well, yeah, no, seriously, I, I appreciate you coming on. I, I, I know you weren't, uh, I know you weren't feeling that good. And Oakland this weekend I'd, got some settings dialed in. We're gonna see. Just gonna see Big Hill put that thing in the main, and you can guarantee that we will be in this room, fucking losing our shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be good, man. We're coming back around. Another week on the bike. Got it actually day of testing in. It's good. KTM's good. Just gotta get used to it. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing too. I guess we didn't even go there, but completely different setup. And those Austrian bikes feel so much different to uh, to the to the uh, the Yam Dog. Yeah, I mean, just the Yamaha like, way, just the way you ride them, like the Yamaha is so, like a kind of like a light switch a little bit. Like you kind of mm. gotta like really be delicate on the Yamaha. Like you gotta really finesse it. And the KTM, like it just kind of feels like the, it's just a pretty easy bike to ride. But you almost kind of have to to work it a little bit more like a 250F. You know, like mm. I feel like it works better like up in the power band, like not just lugging it around. So that kind of I. Uh, yeah, it just took me a little bit to get used to it, but we had a good couple of days, and you know, I like I said, I went pretty hard. We rode pretty much every day last week to get ready for Anaheim, and and then rode Monday, Tuesday. Woke up this morning a little bit under the weather, but we'll be good. Get some rest. Show up to Oakland, ready to roll. Not taking no, taking nothing off nobody in that LCQ. Hopefully, I won't even be in that LCQ. Yeah, no, nah, you go straight through, baby. <laughs> Whole shot that heat yeah, straight good. in. Let's go. It's so fun, dude. It's so fun to be out there. It's like, <laughs> I would be having just as much fun, though, if I was just hanging out with you guys watching the race. But then it's it's just fun. Like, it's like I'm just interacting with what I would do on the weekend anyways, you know? Yeah, I'd yeah, I'd be just yeah. going nuts watching the TV. But instead, I'm down on, the, down on the line, like, stretching my arms out, you know, working on goggles, getting ready to go. It's sweet. So fun. <laughs> Oh, I love it, dude. I'm so here for it. You are just, you're holding, you're doing what like everyone wishes they could do. Like if I was good enough to just go, it's like, oh, I'm a fuck around and make a main event tonight. Like there's not many people in the world that can, that can just be like, you know what? Let's just go fucking do it. I hope I can continue that. That'd be the, dude, I just want to do that as long as I can. It's so fun. Just being able to, being able to stick it out there. It's just, there's nothing like it. I'm pumped. Pumped to be there. You're the man, dude, and you are welcome on this podcast any day of the week. It's just, yeah, it's always a good time when you get in here, dude. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy Gang.